world gone insane. An upside down civilization cannot be real. A world of madness and terror. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Summer is almost here. And that means vacation and sunscreen and going to the movies. It also means that I'm out there on the road slinging the old comedy hash. Fans of my semi-professional level live joke-telling extravaganza can see me shaking my fanny in Austin, Texas at Cap City Comedy May 30th to June 2nd. And then I rejoin Bobcat Goldthwait on the third leg, the third of three, on the show with two heads. That tour will take us on June 6th to Portland, Oregon at the Aladdin Theater. June 7th, we will be in Sacramento, California at Harlow's. June 8th, we will be in San Francisco, California at the Marines Memorial Theater. We're only doing one show in San Francisco, and we would like to see all of our Bay Area friends and fans there. And on June 9th, we will be in Englewood, Colorado, just outside of Denver, at the Gothic Theater. For ticket links and more info, as always, head on over to the live events page at danagould.com. Now, our show this month has two interviews, two in-depth interviews that are connected. One is about a book, and one is about a documentary, each dealing with a classic summer movie, specific to the world of special effects makeup. The book is entitled The Lady from the Black Lagoon, and it is written by Mallory O'Meara. The Lady from the Black Lagoon tells the story of Millicent Patrick. Millicent worked in the Universal Studios makeup department in the early 1950s. And one of the things that Millicent was responsible for was the design of none other than the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Now here's a fun fact. The Creature from the Black Lagoon was not a summer movie. It came out in February of 1954. But I remember watching it on TV in the summer, and it certainly has a lot of swimming in it. In any event, the normal expression for what Millicent did would be her claim to fame was designing the creature from the Black Lagoon. But the fact is, she's not famous for it. Because her credit was, shall we say, appropriated by a lesser talent with more clout and a different gender. Highlight the last part. Not only is The Lady from the Black Lagoon a fascinating look into Hollywood in the 1950s, but it's still relevant today, especially in the way it tells the story of the struggles many women still have in male-dominated genre film, just in their attempts at being treated as equals. We also have Hollywood makeup legend Tom Berman, and director William Conlon. They're here to talk about their new documentary, Making Apes. And here, 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 is how these two stories are connected. The Westmores were known as the first family of Hollywood makeup. At one point, it seemed every major studio in Hollywood had a makeup department that was either run by or employed members of the Westmore family. Universal Studios was run by Bud Westmore, who I think we can safely describe as the Fredo Corleone of the Westmore clan. Bud was a man of average artistic talent, but he knew how to hire the right people and take credit for their work. Just ask Millicent Patrick. Another film that was made on Westmore's watch was The List of Adrian Messenger. This was in the mid-1960s. The list of Adrian Messenger made use of a new kind of screen makeup. Latex appliances, basically pre-sculpted rubber pieces that were then glued onto the actors' faces. This was opposed to building up a fake nose or whatever with putty. 
Now go to 1966. Spring. 20th Century Fox has just greenlit a movie called Planet of the Apes. Now, nobody knows how they're actually going to make the apes that occupy the planet of the apes. And this seems unusual in that the entire film rests on the success of this concept. But they greenlit it anyway, and I admire their chutzpah. In any event, at that time, the makeup department at 20th Century Fox was run by a guy named Ben Nye. And Ben, who was nearing retirement, could see the writing on the wall, and he knew that Planet of the Apes was beyond his grasp. So he said, hey, call Bud Westmore. He just did some amazing work on a film called The List of Adrian Messenger. Now, in the shop at that moment was a young makeup apprentice. And in those days, apprentice makeup men, their job consisted of cleaning up and shutting up. But this apprentice knew something that Ben Nye didn't. And before he knew what he was saying, words came out of his mouth. Bud Westmore didn't do that. That was John Chambers. Now, nobody knew this because, well, that's how Bud Westmore wanted it. But now the cat was out of the bag. Ben Nye turned to his outspoken apprentice, Tom Berman, and said, quite simply, well, call John Chambers. Making Apes is a new documentary that tells the story of how Chambers and his apprentice, a man named Tom Berman, revolutionized special effects makeup and did it in only a couple of months. It's also the story of John Chambers, who, if you saw the film Argo, was the man that John Goodman played. Oh, yeah, I forgot. The whole time he was doing this, he was also secretly working for the CIA. Enough of me blathering on. Let's get on to our filthy business. And worth it. It's showtime. It's a sun dapple day high above the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California. We're here at the Falcons Lair Recording Studios. Spring is spring is turtle heading its way into our lives. I heard about this great book. Uh, Pat Oswalt, a uh, friend, of, friend of the podcast, told me about this book, The Lady from the Black Lagoon, written by Mallory O'Meara. And it's the story of Millicent Patrick. And for those of you who don't know who Millicent Patrick is, and you are probably most of you, uh, she is the person who... Her big claim to fame is she designed the creature from the Black Lagoon. And the reason that you wouldn't know that is because the credit for this very significant contribution to film history was completely taken from her by a uh, by a jealous, insecure uh, executive. And the book was written by uh, a, a young uh, woman named Mallory O'Meara. And we have friends in common, but I don't know her. But I literally just reached out and said, hey, I love your book. I'd love you to uh, to come on the podcast. And she had the uh, uh, a lapse in judgment and agreed to do it. And uh, so I'm delighted to uh, to introduce Mallory O'Meara, uh, fellow mass hole Hell residing yeah. in Southern California. Please welcome Mallory O'Meara. This is the sound of my voice. You put the lie to the nerd, the nerd boy's dream of the <laughs> attractive woman that also likes monsters. We do exist. Yeah. We're here. There's, 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 there's you. <laughs> no, I know, I know several. Uh, I know several, and you give me a wig and a thing of lipstick, and who knows what? Can sure. Happen. Um, but long story longer. Uh, yeah, I knew about Millicent Patrick. They, there's the universal classic monsters that everybody grew up watching dracula frankenstein the wolfman the mummy and then the creature from the black yes. lagoon 
there's a, a 10 year lapse yes. between the Wolfman, which was the last one created. And then the, the Dracula, the mummy and Frankenstein were all in 1931, 30, 31. Yeah. Wolfman was 41. Mm-hmm. And then the creature from the Black Lagoon was 1954. Yes. So that's a, a giant big leap. old jump, big old jump, com- one or two changes in ownership at Universal Studios. Yeah. It was a weird time for Universal. Right. All of the classic monsters were created by a guy named Jack Pierce. Yes. And he was long gone. Yes. That was Uh, the weird changeover when the Universal went through a weird time period where they wanted to be respectable mm -hmm. and make non-monster movies. And they wanted to distance themselves from that monster reputation. Which is what put them on the map. Yes, which is ridiculous. And they quickly realized their error in judgment. And part of that changeover was they got rid of Jack Pierce. And there were a few different reasons. You know, he was getting older. He didn't want to work with foam latex. But they got in Bud Westmore, who ran the monster shop. And he was part of the Westmore legacy. But he was really more of a beauty makeup guy. Right. He was the, the Westmores dude. are the... Uh, the the Gallagher brothers of makeup. They were, <laughs> you know, uh, or Gallagher. Yeah, Gallagher is how they pronounce it. Um, there was uh it, it it's a family dynasty. It's, yes. It, it's it's the it's the Kennedys of makeup or the Bush family of makeup. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Their dad invented the like the idea of a makeup department in film. George Westmore, he was the first guy to ever do it. So they really have an incredible legacy and pedigree in makeup. But again, it's more beauty makeup. It's not monster makeup. Right. And so every studio wanted a Westmore mm-hmm. to run their makeup department. Yes. Bud Westmore uh, was not really uh, the most talented makeup artist of the group. But he was sober. But he was sober. So tell <laughs> Unlike some of the other Westmore right. brothers. So, so how he got this job, if you want to know the level of treachery this dude is capable of doing, yeah. tell the story. Universal makes a call to who? To a man named Ern Westmore. So there were five Westmore brothers, and they were all work. Most of them were all working at various heads of, you know, Paramount, Columbia, uh, Warner Brothers. They were all working at big studios, heading up the makeup department. And Ern Westmore had a twin brother named Perk, and Ern was having a lot of problems with alcoholism. But mm-hmm. they, they finally found out that he was getting back, back on the straight and narrow and Universal wanted to hire him to because they wanted a Westmore brother. They right. found out he was sober. They're like, great, this is awesome. So the night before his interview with Universal, which he thought it was a slam dunk. And he, was, he had come out of what was then rehab. Yes. And was sober. Yes, and ready to work again, all right. excited. and Not a small accomplishment in and of itself. Yes. And his brother, Perk. So all of the Westmore brothers, including their father, they loved to backstab each other. They really mm-hmm. were always trying to get ahead. So his twin brother, Perk, brought him out to celebrate the new job interview by taking him out to drink and just pushed and pushed him, basically cajoled him into getting shit faced and he was so he got him so drunk that he was still drunk when he showed up for the interview the next day and this is not only fucking a guy out of a job who's your brother it's obliterating their sobriety like, yeah this is a thing. yeah it's horrible so universal <laughs> it's a, it's they had no choice they're like we can't hire this guy he's quite literally drunk in the interview and they looked around like do you have any other westmores and bud was the he was bud was working at a smaller studio eagle lion at the time and said i'll do it i'll take the job so for the rest of bud's career he really never got over the chip on his shoulder that he was like the second he was the second string westmore the, they right. really wanted Ernst. But they're like, all right, we'll take Bud. Weird analogy. George H.W. Bush is the Bud Westmore of the Bush family. Wow. Jeb right. was the one that everybody thought was going to be president. Wow. Yeah, and he has a big chip on his shoulder about that. Wow. Yeah. Please clap. Now I get it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was Bud Westmore. He's so, the Bud Westmore of politics. Not only was. But, but, and then again, his presidency was excellent, had no problems at all. Yeah, great. Didn't Fantastic. Make any giant mistakes. Everything no, was we're in such a great place in our country right now, thanks to George W. Bush. <laughs> uh, so, Bud Westmore not only was taking over for arguably the greatest makeup artist of all time, Jack Pierce, but he was not even the one that they truly wanted. Right. So, he really walked in there heading up the Universal Makeup and Monster Shop with a big, big. You know, big shoes to fill, big chip on his shoulder. And he was the kind of guy who, did, you know, it was a big monster shop, big makeup shop. It, he did yeah, mostly admin the, stuff. At this point in the 50s, 
Universal is it's also producing television series. Yeah. It's producing foam. Uh, the, there's a revolution in in makeup. Uh, materials they're using yeah. from rubber. They're doing casting and molding. That that sort yeah. of world has started, mm-hmm. and they're making. It's the fifties, so they're starting to make science fiction movies. So yes, the, the, you know they're starting to make. It's the Watch the Skies era. It's, yeah, it's aliens. It's it's that era in yes. in in sci fi fantasy movies. Yes, we went af- so from being working. afraid of immigrants to being afraid of communists and aliens. Right. Shift a little bit, shift in fear, and so that's exactly what it is. It was so it was a really interesting time in horror, and so Universal really wanted to get into the sci-fi game. But Bud Westmore spent most of his time doing admin stuff, and you know, rightly so, he's the head of a big department. Yeah, but, and, and that's what happens, and you and you do talk huh. about that in the book, as I, you know, as a as a writer who was a showrunner. Once you're a showrunner, you're not really writing as much as you yeah. And no you shame to, in that. You're, well, it's just like you're running a business. Yeah. So, you're but Bud Westmore, a string of Seven Elevens. <laughs> <laughs> he was the kind of guy who, as soon as there were cameras around, he would run in his suit out of the office and stand in front of maquettes and hold paintbrushes. And he really wanted people to think that he was the one designing this stuff and sculpting it and working on it. He wanted to get all the press for it. Right. So this is the stew that so, where. So you're a guy in the makeup department. You're sculpting an alien for it came from outer space. You're working your butt off all day. Then the press kit, the press crew comes in to advertise. Your boss runs in, grabs a paintbrush, shoves you out of the way, and poses next to your thing. Yep. That, so this is the stew that Millis and Patrick walked into. Like decades long, all this resentment and jealousy. This was really, and it wasn't just something that he did to Millis and Patrick. He was known for being really horrible to his employees. If someone started getting really talented, he would treat them like garbage. He really, I mean, he was great with his stars and great with his actors, and he was a super sweet guy if like, you were the right an person. An insecure bully kissed up punch down yes a hundred percent so this is what mills not and like Patrick, anybody we know now no no one ever does that or country no especially uh, not big leaders no no it's 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 it's, mag, it's magnanimous city that's the new <laughs> name of our country we are speaking from what i can only describe a, a sun dappled uh, th- this would be a sunroom, I would think, and uh, and and beautiful uh, uh, on the California coast. And uh, talking to uh, the creative forces behind a, a, a new documentary that uh, that I recently saw called "Making Apes." Now, everyone who listens to this podcast knows my uh, my deep affinity uh, for Planet of the Apes, and. The more I have my career and the more I'm in show business and I do my little TV show, I, I, I continue to be astounded that the thing got made uh, and, and how it got made. And uh, especially, uh, most importantly, the makeup, because as we will discuss, more than any movie I can imagine, if the makeup didn't work, that movie wasn't happening. And they greenlit the movie and started spending money before they knew it would work. And there's never been a, a, a true telling of that story, although the movie is called Making Apes. It's it's about much more than that. It's about making a movie, and truly this movie did revolutionize how makeup was used in films in Hollywood for, for time of memoriam. And uh, what's also alarming is I think they only did it in about, they had about a two- to three-month startup it didn't seem to be that much time but why listen to me guess i'm actually speaking to one of the people that was actually there uh tom berman uh hollywood makeup legend is is here and the director of making apes will conlin thank you so much for for letting me talk to you today oh you're very welcome yeah i'm so glad i got your name right <laughs> <laughs> and i'm joined by bud westmore bud thank you so yeah much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um you know, Bud, Bud Westmore. It was funny because uh, I, you saw in the movie in our in our documentary how they wanted Bud Westmore because he did uh, List of Adrian Messenger, and John Chambers had really done that. Well, John Chambers right. had uh, such a hatred for Bud. Yes, because Bud 
Bud sent John Chambers down to stand by on stage one day for somebody who was a regular makeup artist that was going to had some kind of appointment and couldn't be there. So John went down. When he came back up to the lab, he found Bud Westmore with the uh, sculpting tools in his hand and all the photographers, and he was sculpt by asking, you know, he was... He was Get, being photographed sculpting John's yeah, work. Yeah. yeah, and John, John had a real big ego, and he that he went up, and so he told Buddy, he said, "You know, Bud, you guys all have bad hearts. You, you Westmores, huh?" He said, "So when you you die, I'm going to tell you." I'm going to find out where they bury you. I'm going to remove the headstone. I'm going to put a toilet up there. And every morning, I'm going to go up there and do my morning constitutional. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was told by Bud, I'm told by John Chambers when I worked at Universal, I was told by uh, John that he said, you know what? They'll pick you up in a, in a, in a, in a limousine. And then they'll, on your last day, they'll, They'll they'll take you back to your car in a dump truck, a yeah. garbage truck. Yeah. And I thought, well, God, it just... So on my very first day at Universal, I get out of my car, a limo pulls up. You Tom Berman? <laughs> what? <laughs> so it's really I true. didn't know they always had a, a limousine for makeup people and they knew that when they were, when your call was they'd always drive to the give you a, a ride from the from the parking lot. Yeah, because you're there first. But I'm thinking, what is gonna be? <laughs> <laughs> He was right. Yeah. When did you start at Universal? Was Universal your first job in Hollywood? No. No, my very first job was that I uh, I worked at Don Post Studios. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. And I was hired to sculpt the big King Kong gorilla with my father. And John Chambers was that was that half fifty percent of that project that he was doing for the uh, Wax Museum in Niagara Falls was uh, uh, John Chambers. And, and this and is late fifties, mid fifties. No, this is nineteen sixty six. Okay. 66 and so, as i said late late 50s yeah 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 that's late late 50s <laughs> yeah and so uh, i was hired to do that and um i was uh, um so your father was a makeup artist no well, well he did do makeup he did some makeup but he worked with jack pierce my father cast the original pieces for the wolfman uh, my father was a sculptor did monumental sculptures in, in the in nebraska and right. uh, came out to california and finally worked in the studios and he became a, like a special uh, um he made the silver-headed cane that uh, oh really uh, that the wolfman carried and now much of this i know i'm yeah. playing dumb for yeah okay and he made and he made yeah. this the the, the Snake in in uh, um, in uh, uh, the Jungle Book, the the co- Cobra. Oh, really? In yeah, the he made Sabu the, he made the bats, the flying bats that were in in uh, the Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah. So your father made that. That's my father. That's yeah. um, so anyhow, this makeup artist came there and he wanted a quart of rubber and he told me about there was an apprenticeship at Fox and so uh, uh, that, that I should call them and because I told him I wanted to be a makeup artist and, and you, did you you grew up. In Southern California? Or? I did. I okay. did. And I, all of us kids worked with my father making props, and we made rubber Indian heads and spears and clubs and things like that. Right. We made a hippopotamus. And we, you, you said this before. Your, your father sculpted the silver-headed cane that Claude Rains used to kill Lon Chaney Jr. and correct. the Man, Right. Yeah. And that is now at... Uh, Bob, Bob Burns. Burns' house. Well, Bob Burns used to come and visit my dad's studio, which was right down the street from him. In Burbank, yeah. When I think Bob was probably maybe fourteen at the time, I was probably eight or something like that. And uh, he used to come there all day. He was infatuated with yeah. the work that my dad did. So nicest guy in the he, world. He was always hanging out there. Yeah, Bob is. Uh, and and what I love about Bob Burns, you go to Bob's house, and there's the Wolfman's cane, and, and but he, he goes hold it, he like he give you like hold it. Yeah, and have the King Kong armature. Like, hold it. Yeah. Um, there's a big party uh, that uh, is, goes on L.A. every year called 20 Wonder. And it's a, it's a benefit for, um, for a research into Down syndrome. It's all about the 20 uh, the chromosome. And Joel Hodgson from Mystery Science Theater and his brother Jim uh, put it on. And, it's, and everybody comes. It's a big party. And I was at a 20 Wonder. And Bob Burns was there with the King Kong armature, and Dan Castellaneta was there. And I got to introduce King Kong to Homer Simpson. (laughs) (laughs) That was my my weird claim to fame. So that must have been just an amazing uh, time to be working in Hollywood because, you know, you talk about your father working for Jack Pierce. Jack Pierce, all of those classic makeups are, are built up with, you know, cotton and... Collodion, is that what yeah. it was? It was, yeah. it was Collodion. Yeah. yeah. And then 
it moves into uh, rubber pieces. Like I think towards the end, the, the Wolfman had like a rubber nose that they. Well, it did. That, that was my father's expertise. He worked with latex and he formulated latex, and not many people knew much about foam latex back then. And probably the best one was an example of fo- early foam latex was the uh, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame on Cl- on, on Charles Lawton, on Charles and that Lawton. was done by uh, George Bow and Gordon Bow and they George and and uh, uh, and Perce Westmore, and that foam back then was created and invented by George Bow. It's the foam that they use today, but they don't use much foam in anymore. Most of it's silicone. Uh-huh. Yeah. But but you what is what is amazing is that you don't you don't realize, you know, you people who go to movies and love movies, you know about the stars and you know about, you know, whatever. But there's a t- technically there's a revolution going on behind the scenes. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the, one of the reasons Jack Pierce uh, from what I understand, uh, you know, uh, he didn't adapt well to new technology and yeah. new technology takes over. But so you're you're doing that in 1966. Uh, that's right around the time that Arthur P. Jacobs is traveling around with his script for a movie called Planet of the Apes. Yeah. And they they take it around and everyone says no two and three times, which I completely get, you know, like you read that script and you go, especially when you think of the technology at the time, you go, yeah, fascinating. Can't be done. Yeah. And Charlton Heston, and and you really got to give him a lot of credit. He goes, no, he was either really dumb (laughs) <laughs> or really smart. But he's like, no, I think I think it'd be a great movie. And and he signs on. And so they famously do a test with Charlton Heston and Edward G. Robinson, what we would call today a proof of concept, just to see if Charlton Heston can act in a scene with an orangutan and have it not be funny. Yeah. And it works. But the makeup is... He looks, Stiff and... he looks like the cowardly lion more than yeah. anything else, but but it did work. Um, were you at Fox then? I wasn't. I came to Fox in July, I think sixteenth, sixty six, and I think that was done in March, uh-huh. March or May. I'm not sure. They had just done it. I right. saw some of the pieces and whatnot, and and um, so I I did I had I had no idea that about i didn't know that they were, they were approached i didn't know what those planet of the apes thing makeups back then were even for they right. didn't mention it and it wasn't until i heard them talking about them wanting to get bud westmore when i was cleaning up after uh, uh uh ben nye in his in his room his makeup station that i my ears perk up and i knew how much john disliked bud westmore westmore and they told me to call john to see if he'd come in and pick up a script Who is Millicent Patrick? Why why do we care about Millicent Patrick? So Millicent, she designed Creature from the Black Lagoon, and she did a lot of work in the Universal Monster Department and makeup department at that time. So she met Bud because she was on set working as a background actress, and she was this incredibly talented artist. She started her first job. And to her detriment, beautiful. Yes, that's another big one. That'll come into play later. Uh, She started her her, her first job out of college was working at Disney. You know, she was this really, really talented artist. She was one of the original... Not the first woman animator, but one, one of the, the original, first, yeah. yeah, and worked on Fantasia, I believe, right? Yeah, and Dumbo, Reluctant Dragon. She was super talented. And so she came in, and she was you know, working as a background actress on Universal, but while she was having a lot of downtime on set, like all actors do, mm-hmm. she would sketch her co-stars. So she had these great, talented drawings, and Bud Westmore saw them while she was in the makeup chair for some movie and hired her to do concept work. What we would call now she, a concept artist. They didn't really uh-huh. have that term back then. But she would design beauty makeups for him. And then when the big changeover came and they're like, we want to start making science fiction movies, he said, I want you to design an alien. He put her to task and see, wanted to see if she could take Ray Bradbury's very nebulous description from the It Came From Outer right. Space cr- script and turn it into an alien. And she did it. And the, the, the movie is still considered you know, an imp- a very it important film. It Came From Outer Space is, 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 a, is a great film. And it's, the, it's really the sort of Rosetta Stone of 
fifties alien invasion movies. It it has everything. It has the it has Richard Carlson as the boring white pipe smoking tweety yes. scientist. <laughs> it it has uh, it 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 takes place in Albuquerque or so. It, it just yep. it looks it's- great. Um, it has. There's an invasion of the body snatchers element mm-hmm. to it. You don't know who really is who, yes. which is the whole communist paranoia underpinning of the whole yes. story. And I don't even think that that was what Ray Bradbury had in mind. But movies tend to back into what they're about. Yes. Uh, they back into the me- their meaning in their era. For you sure. Know, you know, um, uh, Get Out is a great example of you know, Get Out could have been made in 1950 as a Twilight Zone episode. Oh, for sure. But it was made when it was made and who made it and it became about something greater than itself. And and yes. and, 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 and 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 that's how uh, that's great art that you can uh, uh, it absorbs it, it absorbs meaning in yeah. its context. Uh, and, and it came from outer space as one of those. And the alien really is, it's unusual. It's not just a guy in a suit. It's not the thing. It looks like an world. eyeball in a baggie. It's yeah. a very weird looking alien. But I mean, if you read what Ray Bradbury's description of the alien was, it was like this paragraph long, very Ray Bradbury-esque. You know, the, he literally used the word nebulous. So it was very mm-hmm. hard for Millicent to take that crazy Ray Bradbury-esque design paragraph and turn it into something real. She made a Tons and tons of the designs, and they ended up getting saved later so they could use them on this island Earth. Right. Uh, so she also worked on that movie. But this was Universal's first science fiction movie, and she knocked it out of the park and really put Universal on the science fiction map. Right. And was their sort of return to monster movies. Right. It wasn't a major studio. It yes. was one of the smaller ones. Mm-hmm. They had a giant claim to fame with their monster movies in the 30s. Then the production code came in. Mm-hmm. They stopped making them. They started making Deanna Durbin musicals e- in the 40s. Yikes. And then they wanted to be uh, respectable. Yes. With a change of management. Which that, didn't work out so well. It's just one of those things like people just can't do what they do. Yeah. Just, just do what you do. Yeah. And get rich in your niche, bitch, as they no, like to say. Seriously. And then they figured out, you know what, maybe we should go back to this. Because this was also a time period when there was a brand new audience that no one had catered to before, which was teenagers. Mm-hmm. People were trying to get kids out of seats. or out, You know, they were competing with television for the very, very first right. time. They really wanted to get people into those theaters. And no one had ever thought to cater to teenagers before. So this was science well, and fiction there was were perfect. teenagers, but really yeah. teenagers became... A market. Yes. In the 40s. Yes. Yeah. So science fiction was to movies what like Harry Potter was to books in the 90s, you know? Well put. And it was a really interesting time. So it wor- totally worked out, and they, Melissa knocked it out of the park. And remember, this is amazing she was the first woman to ever work in a makeup department like this no other woman was ever had ever done this was was doing this no other woman worked in a makeup time at this time makeup department at this time she's so so she's you you would think she would be again that's the crime of it she was one of the first female animators at disney Mm -hmm. she was the first woman to work in a major studio makeup department and and then designed two or three really iconic characters, specifically the creature from the Black Lagoon, which is crazily iconic. I mean, people that have never seen the movie that never would see the movie. No creature. Know who the creature is. Oh, yeah. And, you know, she's the only woman to design one of Universal's classics. That entire pantheon, they're all, I mean, most of them are Jack Pierce because, you know, Jack fucking Pierce. But she's the only woman <laughs> to design not, one of those. Not a lot of people know his middle name. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that's why you write a book like this to get all those sweet research details. <laughs> and she was the only woman to do it. So that's what's amazing about her to me is that, you know, so many women are into horror and so many there's so many monster girls out there not knowing that we have this massive legacy in the genre. You know, Millicent's been was doing it in the fifties. And yeah. nobody because of Bud Westmore, nobody knows her name. It's amazing. Uh, what happened was, uh, and, and well, let's come back to this because you're you're at an interesting point in in, in your telling. Um, you're a producer. Yes. You work in in, in horror movies. Yes. You've produced. Uh, tell us some, of, so, Mallory. Tell us some of your uh, 
resume. My two. IMDBS. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. So I'm a producer for our movie uh, production company called Dark Dunes Productions. We do indie genre films that really right. focus on practical special effects. Right. We've done, um, do you know Alan Gillis? We did Harbinger Down, mm-hmm. Lord of Tears. Uh, I pr- help produce Kids vs. Monsters. We have a movie out right now called Yama Song, March of the Hollows, which, which has is, uh, a puppet movie right. with Whoopi Goldberg, Nathan Fillion, George Decay. It has a great cast, but it's all practical. real. It's all real puppetry. It's not stop motion. It's not right. animation. And that's Does George Takei at some point in the film. Say, no, sadly. Oh my. We we thought about it. His his character is very solemn. We should have got a blooper reel that was just his puppet going oh my every time oh he my. sees something bad happening. Oh my. We did have we have that in an interview, but we don't have it <laughs> on the screen, which is sad. But and be uh, one of the he, reasons, as you know, yes, he's. A lovely man. He is so wonderful. He got, yeah, he was in a comfy old man cardigan and you just want to give him a hug. He's so fantastic. But the reason, one of the reasons why I found out that I could do this stuff was when I found out about Millicent when I was 17 years old. Up until that point, all my heroes, Rick Baker, Tom Savini, Dick Smith, Jack Pierce, Jack fucking Pierce, I should say now, (laughs) uh, they're all dudes. I never thought right. that I could do that. You know, I just never envisioned myself in that world. And it wasn't until I was trolling online and by troll, like T R A W L. No, no, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, not a troll. Not. Uh, looking for pictures of behind the scenes photos on Creature that I found a picture of Mills and Patrick working on the suit. And I thought, holy shit, girls do this? Never, right. never had that moment before in my life. And how did you? Was this in Famous Monsters? Or no, just in... on some on some dude's blog. Uh-huh. I don't even remember. I had just seen the movie for the first time, fell in love with it, and was just searching around on Google trying to find pictures of you know who made the suit, how did it, how they shoot it underwater. There's magazine. How did you discover Millicent Patrick at all? Just the magic of the internet. It just it was there was a picture of her on some dude's blog. Like most nerds do. I think one thing that really unites all of us after we watch a cool movie is we, especially a horror movie or a monster movie, we want to know how it's made. We want to know how they shot it. We want to know all the cool behind the scenes stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was just searching on Google for photos and trivia and articles, you know, looking on the IMDb. And I just saw on someone's blog a picture of a woman working on the suit. And I don't mean like a posed photo and like she was working right. and it, it was like getting struck by lightning. I couldn't believe it. Right. Yeah, it, it is amazing. And you, here's what struck me about your book that I, that I, I, I that really set it up, set it apart from all of these other similar books. The it, fish stick jokes? The fish stick jokes. <laughs> and she did not say fish stick. You heard her correctly the first time. <laughs> Two things. One, it's, it's not only a great book about Millicent Patrick that has a fascinating story, but it's a great book about writing a book about Millicent Patrick. Yes. You really did tell your own story and that you and Millicent share a journey and that you're both very, uh, you're, you're, you're women in a, in a, in a, uh, in a man's world. And because you're smart and affable and, and, uh, and attractive, that brings in a whole barrel of headaches. Yes. That it's like, it's yes, not, it's a great way to put it. Yeah. It, it's not only are you, you know, not only are you where you're not supposed to be because the horror movies are dudes world yeah, or a makeup department at universal in the fifties is a dudes world. So you have to justify being where you are for no other reason than uh, it's new. And because you're attractive, people assume you have your job because you're sleeping with somebody or because you're pretty. Like it's like, even if you are here, well, you clearly don't deserve to be here. It must be. Uh, And, and I will say it is a, you know, I was genuinely surprised uh, at the shit that you've had to deal with that you talk about in the book. I really didn't uh, a- anticipate that it was still that overt. Yeah. Well, that's why I wrote the book like that because I didn't, it's so easy to be like, Oh, you know, this was 1954 when this happened to our things were different back then. And I wanted to nope. really show people, no motherfuckers. It's not, it really isn't. And that's why her story is so important because it's still happening right now. Yeah. And I really wanted to make it feel urgent for people. And the best way I knew how to do that was to tell stories from my own experiences working in the same industry that she did 65 years later. 
Yes, yeah, 65 years later, and still someone, you, uh, someone asked you when you were working on the film... Kids well, versus what, Monsters. Kids vs. Monsters. They, did they literally ask you how often you have to sleep with your boss to have your job? Yeah, as if it was, that's how I clock in, you know? It's crazy. And they, and he wasn't even, what was the most offensive part was he wasn't even making fun of me. He was asking a question. He legitimately wanted to know as if that was part of my like morning ritual, you know, like have my coffee, may, write up my schedule for the day, fuck my boss, and then go to work. It was, and the amazing part was he watched all of this happening he asked me that question while I was working. And this is two years ago? This That was in 2014. Okay. So five years ago at this point. Could he ask that question today? He could. He could. Uh, he might not get away with it. I yeah. still hear stories. Uh, things are changing a little bit, uh -huh. but not as fast as you'd think. Did Ben Nye run the Fox makeup department at the time? He did. The, he did. He did. He did. And did, uh, so, and Fox at that time has Lost in Space. Is that shooting there They yet? were shooting Lost in Space at that time. Shooting. Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. All that or when Batman. Stuff. Batman is on the lot at that yes, time. Yes, Batman was on yeah. the lot. I often watch Batman on MeTV and he drives by my old office all the time. My oh, old, really? <laughs> <laughs> my, my executive building office when I was on The Simpsons. I was like, hey, that's. My my office is in the Gotham City Town Hall. Yeah. Um, uh, so so it's it it's a it's a crazy time to be on that lot. It was, you know, it was it was a crazy a, time to be in Los Angeles. Well, I think you know, I I look back and I think how how wonderful it was because it was really a piece of Hollywood. You'd go to the um, commissary and you'd see the the, the cast from uh, Voyages of the Bottom of the Sea. And you'd see the, some of the people from 12 O'Clock High in their costumes. Uh, 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 and and uh, a Lost in Space, Bob May played inside the, right. the Bob May. The and, you know, here, he, here the, the robot had this voice, Robinson, Will Robinson. And then you'd hear Bob May, who just had, you know, he'd always leave his black pancake makeup right. on it around his eyes so people know he was something. <laughs> And he had a voice like this. Oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. <laughs> but it was really a wonderful time because here they had feature films and television and all these people come in the commissary. And it was like a one of those old um, pieces right out of a, a Hollywood film. Yeah, absolutely. You know? uh, it's great. John Landis at the, at the screening of Making Apes that we were all at at USC, uh, John Landis was talking about uh, being on the Fox lot and they were filming beneath the planet of the apes. And they were also filming, um, some, some movie that had a giant ballroom sequence with a bunch of men in drag. Justine, I think it was. Justine. Yeah. And we were putting rubber, uh, uh breasts on these guys. Okay. And also here they were <laughs> walking around the yeah. commissary. Well, they said the craziest thing you ever saw yeah. was just the commissary room. And it was full of guys in dresses and gorillas. Yeah. <laughs> that was the entire. Yeah. yeah, I love that that old sort of Hollywood. So so after so they say we're going to we're going to go ahead with this movie. The Ben Nye stuff isn't cutting it. Let's get Bud Westmore. You're literally in the room and you say I I I it was a moment. I had a Tourette's moment because I'm an apprentice. I'm not supposed to be talking. How old you are you know? at this point? I was 26. 26. And I just said uh I just said, you know, but Westmore didn't do it, and <laughs> and and, uh, and Ben and I turned and said, "How do you know?" And I said, well, "I know because I was at John Chambers' house. I've seen the pictures. I've seen the stuff he did. I've seen the the, the applications." And he said, "Oh, get him on the phone." So I called him on the phone. He was making Spock's ears at the time. He said, I can't come right. over there. And I said, but they want Bud Westmore. And I hear John go, Ugh, I'll but be right there. Look at the, look, but look at just the nexus of like nerd pop culture. Like you're there in the room and you go, John Chambers did it. You call John Chambers. He's busy making Mr. Spock's ears. Yeah. Like if you could stop making Mr. Spock's ears, do you want to come over here and talk about this movie Planet of the Age? Yeah. Like to me, it's, it's, I still didn't even know the title of the movie. Yeah. He said, what is it? I said, I don't know. I don't know, yeah. but it's a big movie. 
Now, did Ben Nye retire? Because the next he was, thing I know, Dan Streetback. He there. was planning on retiring. He said, uh-huh. if they do this movie, it's going to be too much. And his lab man, who did that special kind of work, was a man by the name of Dick Smith, not the famous Dick Smith oh, okay. from New York. The, the other Dick Smith. A crotchety old guy with gout in his foot and right. complaining all the time. But what I realized is that he kept that lab, the makeup lab, he had locked for 35 years. Only he went in there or somebody that he allowed to go in there. And my job was because the reason why that Ben and I hired me because I knew how to make molds, I knew how to sculpt, I knew how to do a lot of things. I wasn't a makeup artist, but he knew that they were, the Planet of the Apes was going to go. So he was uh-huh. hiring me to learn from Dick Smith. Okay. But Dick Smith, not to take anything away from him, he's a crotchety old guy, but yeah. I, what I realized in working for him and assisting him of what he didn't know. He knew right. very little. He never could have pulled this off. Right. No. So I, it was a perfect storm. It, it was a perfect storm. I, I to this day, I, I don't know. I don't know how he pulled it off. And so he, there, there's a weird. And again, like uh, to me, it's so fascinating. Ben Nye leaves. Dan, does Dan Streepak come in before John Chambers or after John? Well, Chambers? John Chambers and Dan Streepak came from NBC, okay. and they used to do the um, Pinky Lee show. Pinky Lee. Ho, ho, he, she, sure. but he, she, 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 Pinky Lee. And what people don't understand is Pinky Lee was the inspiration for Pee Wee Herman. Right? Yeah, Pee-wee. a vaudevillian yeah. character. And yeah. they used to do the show. They paired up and they did the show together, the Pinky Lee show, and that's where right. they met. So when uh, Ben and I said he was leaving, he was going to, they were, the studio wanted to start interviewing uh, department heads. John said, I know who, John, but bring in Dan Streepak. Okay, and he, they hit it off right away, and then yeah. they Dan's over o- old, overlapped neighbor, a little bit. I said he was uh, Dan was my old neighbor. Yeah, I know. Yeah, a great uh, guy. The best department in, in the business. Yeah. He's the, oh, he ma- he demanded that we called ourselves not makeup men, which we always did back then. We were makeup artists, and he gave credit for the very first department he had to gave the credit to all of his people that worked in their department. And and, and that uh, although you would think, and and this is a thing that is it happens in the world today in show business and especially in politics you know you know it's like um people it's a strange thing um a lot of people don't like to give credit they like to hog all the credit uh and they don't understand that people don't discern that it it's if 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 it if it works if you're there and it's great you get the credit too it doesn't if i say that was a, you know on i had a little tv show and somebody was like oh my favorite episode was that i always oh that was written by jessica conrad she's a really great writer and because it doesn't take away from me no. Su- there's success isn't like a pie there's not a there's a there's an infinite amount of appreciation that doesn't mean there's less for me if i give credit to someone else I um uh the the people that really understood it and and I've seen this in comedy a lot. Jerry Seinfeld knew that if Michael Richards got a big laugh, he still got credit cuz he's there too. Mm. He didn't have to jump in and step on the laugh. And you see this in in makeup all the time uh and in special effects that you know the the head of the department doesn't want to give credit because they want to, you know, yeah. the famous stories of Bud Westmore running down and holding up a sculpting piece next to somebody's sculpture that's not his. Um, and I understand when you run a department, having run a department, you, you're a manager. You're on the phone all the de- all day doing stuff. You don't have time to do the thing that yeah. got you the job. Well, Bud Westmore told John Chambers, he said, everybody knows who the Westmores are, but they don't know who you are. That. That was the, and we're going to do a deep dive into John Chambers. But okay. do you do you know the story of how Bud got the job at Universal? No, uh, Mallory O'Meara, who wrote the Millis and Patrick book, uh, to, it's, this story is in the book. They wanted Earn, mm. Westmore. Yeah, Earn had just gotten out of what was now what is now called rehab which then was called something else, but he was an alcoholic and he, yeah. and he dried out. So the night before his interview, Bud took him out for a drink. Perfect. And another drink and another drink and another drink and threw his brother off the wagon and he showed up hammered, didn't get the job, Bud got the job. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you got to admire the, the as as uh, you have. To, this is a phrase that I got from the movie Making Apes, which I'd never heard before. And I think you somebody was talking about John Chambers, and I've never heard this expression before. And now I love it. That guy had a set of cashews. Oh, that's that's Fred Blau. <laughs> Fred Blau. Freddie Blau said that. Yeah, he was. <laughs> That's quite a set of cashews. Yeah, he did, he he would stand up. Didn't matter crowd or anything else. If he thought he was right, he he's one of those people that stood up in that crowd and declared himself. Well, you you and, need you know people that uh, I, I'm going to make a I'm, I'm going to make a, a weird comparison. I'm not you know but you look at somebody like Henry Ford or Steve Jobs or or uh, somebody that has a singular vision, and and they are brilliant. They're you know, the all of these people. John Chambers was brilliant. And, you know, and they know they're right. And I think whatever it is in their mind that allows them to make those leaps of intellect, they don't have time for the social nicety. I, I can't yeah. deal with it. I can't. Yeah. Please. Like, I'm, I, I'm like. They're that. focused. And they, they... Yeah. When I'm, when, in, in, I will give you an example. In The Simpsons, like in the writer's room, they, they didn't laugh politely at a bad pitch. They would say something funny, maybe. I remember once I pitched a joke that didn't really land, and my friend said, the loud buzzing of the light bulbs tells me that that's a pass. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, or somebody once said, somebody pitched a joke and someone just went, said the word, yawn. (laughs) You know, so yeah, it's like when there's there's work to be done, there's work to be done. Uh, so I uh, had this show uh, called Stand Against Evil, and I'm on the set one day, and I'm talking to the cinematographer, the DP, about a shot. And he goes, well, we could do this, or we could do this. And and I sat there and I said, um, uh, I don't know, Tim, I, whatever one you like, I don't have my dick out about it. Just like, meaning, I, I, I whatever yeah. one you like, I don't care. Yeah. Well... A young woman who was a PA heard that, took offense, and I found out later that there was a report filed. Oh, no. So we had to, to deal with that. Wow. And that annoyed me to no end. And yeah, that is kind of weird. that's the kind of story that white men will focus on Yeah. as the problem with the Me Too era is that there's over, is that you can't say stuff like that. Yes. That's not what it's about. No, the problem is there's real serious issues that need to be dealt with. And you will always have people that are over exuberant. Yes, of course. Will file. It's the same people who want to ask right. the manager, want to talk to the manager right. about things. Yeah. You know, that's it, it's annoying. But that's not what it's about. Exactly. And and. and and because men have the biggest bullhorn, those are the stories that get the most attention. Mm-hmm. When really, I was sincerely astounded by the 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 stuff that you uh, were talking about. And there was a lot of stuff that I didn't put in the book because I didn't want to make it. Dep- I mean, it's not. There's a part, a lot of parts of this book that are not happy and are not fun to read, and I didn't want to just you know, smash people yeah. over the head. No, but, it's a great, it's a great book. It, 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 it's, it's a really entertaining read. And, and I, I don't, don't want to give the, the false uh, illusion. The, the way you track uh, the, the parallels between the two of you and the things that you learned as you, as you went to sort of work to give this woman her due are uh are 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 really um amazing what's also interesting is so she gets royally screwed there's yes. no other way to put it no um, there that's that's the w- yeah. way to put it yeah when when the creature from the black lagoon came out the publicity department said hey look we have this incredibly attractive well-spoken woman that works in the makeup department, let's send her out on a publicity tour yeah. to promote the film. Which was cool in itself because uh, no, and that's never been done and it hasn't, it hasn't been done since. There's been no major studio that's like, hey, let's take our creature designer and send them out to promote the movie. And as you know, as a monster nerd, 
you know, this is an area of film that still, you know, doesn't get the credit that it's due, especially people sued actors, uh, pe- you know, the Shape of Water designers did not get nominated for an Oscar. That That's makeup, amazing. That makeup team. So it's, I mean, it's, even now it's still an area that really it doesn't get, get the awards and the accolades that it deserves. But back then, like, wow, sending a woman, sending the creature designer on a press tour, it was amazing. Except Bud Westmore wasn't interested in that. Right. And it's all. important for people to know that the Shape of Water is essentially creature from the black lagoon fan fiction yeah it's 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 a high-end remake of the creature from the black lagoon yeah with the story reimagined yeah a hundred percent and it was the best picture oh yes deservedly so oh yeah but it's like this isn't some weird minor harm this is a this movie's a big thing in, yeah. in cinema history. And it wouldn't exist without Millis and Patrick. Yeah. So Bud Westmore, who loved his publicity, said no. Because back then, there wasn't a 10-minute end crawl at the end of a movie. Only the heads of production got screen credit for movies. So even though there was a whole team working for Bud Westmore, he was the one that just said make up by Bud Westmore on movies. And it still says that on Creature. So he didn't want people to know that he wasn't the one designing all this stuff. So he said, no, 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 no. You can't be... Can't be uh, the, the tour as it's envisioned because they wanted to be the beauty who does, who created the beast. Right. They shunted That's her. That's what they wanted it to be, the beauty yes. who created a beast. And even though that was true, Bud Westmore said, no, I did it. Yeah. So he, they rebranded it as the beauty who lives with the beast. So she became, you know, the creature's roommate, I guess, to <laughs> yes. like, so, so stupid. And who th- cleans up after the beast. Yeah. It's so, such a weird, like they, of course, shunted her into this insane. maternal it's, role. It's, it's so dumb. And they told her, yeah, all right, you'll, you can still go out on the tour, but you have to lie and say, Bud Westmore designed it. And here's your script that you yeah. have to read. You have to go out on the road and say that somebody else did the work that you did. Yep. And she was like, all right. All right, I'll do it. She was a team player. She did it. And but even with all of that in mind, while she was on the press tour, she went on the radio, she was on TV, she got interviewed for newspapers. Bud Westmore was so jealous, so jealous to the point where he tracked everywhere that she went and would call up the newspaper reporters after they talked to her, demanding to know what she had said. Even though she was chaperoned. It was crazy. And he was still so jealous of what of of the fact that she was on this tour that he fired her while she was on it. Yeah. And she came back to no job and he, they took her off this island earth. They took her off all the movies that she was working on and she never worked behind the scenes ever again. It's amazing. It, I mean, he is, he, he is, sounds like Donald Trump in a makeup department. I mean, just like yeah. incredibly petty, incredibly insecure, incredibly narcissistic. Yeah. And all for good reason. Cause he was not good at his job. Um, it, 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 it's so amazing. And, and then Millicent Patrick, in 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 a way that it was very touching that it infuriated you took it lying down yes and that's really it took me a long time to forgive her right because i realized that i was doing the same thing to her that we still do to women well why didn't you say anything Mm -hmm. why were you wearing that why were you doing this and i realized holy shit i'm judging her now right i'm the one i mean at this point you know she was almost 40 she had been working in hollywood for almost 20 years you know she had this incredible career when did she take when did she get the chance to take a fucking break you know true and then and when you wonder why she took it lying down then you look at her dad yep that Who was bingo bingo Bud westmore it's yep. like of course she took it like that yep this is all she knew yep uh tell tell a little bit about her her dad uh, a guy named well you you go ahead her dad was a man named camille rossi and he worked as the superintendent of construction on hearst castle for 10 years when they were when millicent was a kid so that's where she grew up right was, hearst was, castle the giant uh giant uh Castle in San Simeon that William Randolph Hearst went, the uh, inspiration for Xanadu and Citizen Kane. Yeah. Xanadu! Yeah, it's so... they. That there's a lot of weird Hearst Millicent Still there. connection. You can yeah. tour it. You can I go. just toured it. Yep. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful place, and that's where she got to run around when she was a kid. But the Camille her, Rossi... Her dad was the chief engineer. Yeah, so Camille Rossi, he was the superintendent of construction... But he wasn't the boss. The boss was a woman named Julia Morgan. And Julia Morgan was this incredible female architect. She, I think it was almost 800 buildings. So Julia Morgan and William Randolph Hearst had a great 
relationship. They really respected each other. Mm -hmm. But Camille did not like having to answer to a woman. Right. And they had constant tensions where he would undermine her constantly. He would go over her head. He just really wanted to prove to her that he was better than her. And he would, and then Camille Rossi would tell his family bad things about her. So this was the model that she was yeah. learning when she was a kid. You're 26 years old. How, how is it that you're not worried about going to Vietnam being, or were you too old at that point? I was, I had, I had been in the Marine Corps. Oh, you were in the Marine Corps? Yeah. Is, I, that, is I, that your tattoo? Yeah. Well, it used to say, death before dishonor, but through the years it's become blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it said death before dishonor, but the more you live, you're like, maybe a little dishonor is not so Yeah, <laughs> Quite, I, can't, I can't defend it anymore. <laughs> yeah, my the Gould family crest is two lions on a couch over a banner that says death before <laughs> intimacy. So With I, a cigarette. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I totally understand. You can see that tattoo in those, in the photos of you with yeah. Chambers in 66, 67 in the yeah. lab. Um, and I've seen those, I've seen those photos and it's so weird. Like, Oh, I wonder who that guy is. And then I'm talking to you. It's, it's very bizarre. Um, so you were already in the Marine Corps. You didn't have to worry about, yeah. uh, uh, did you serve? Did you, I mean, did you see action or were you in the, no, I was in the big one. I was in the cold war. Right. But uh, and I saw the, action in places like San Diego, Tijuana, sure. San Clemente. I spent uh, a year and a half in Okinawa. Uh huh. In uh, in the fifties. In in the sixties. In the fifties. In the fifty yeah. nineteen fifty eight to uh, nineteen fifty nine. Yeah, that must have been. A, yeah, that that was the height of the Cold War, and that was a. Yeah. Yeah, that was a tense, uh, crazy time. So that must have been something. Really. Let me ask you one other question before I deep dive. Just I always imagine if I if I could time travel, you know, and and. Uh, it, it, it's probably a testament to my shallowness. I would not want to go to the signing of the Magna Carta, <laughs> but, you know, but there was that summer of 1967 in LA where you could like Star Trek was being filmed on the Paramount lot. The doors were the house band at the whiskey, a go, go planet of the apes was being filmed in Malibu. <laughs> and this is all at the same time. I just like that. It, it, it's just this cross cultural, like so much stuff that, profoundly influenced my childhood was going on in the same place at the same time. The house that we bought in Ojai, we bought from a guy named Guy Webster. Guy Webster was a very famous rock and roll photographer. Guy Webster shot the Doors' first album cover. He shot the Beach Boys. He shot everything at Monterey Pop. Um, but I was thinking, you probably didn't have time to like go out and see concerts and shows like that you were getting up at no. two three in the morning yeah no I, I, that's all i did it's all i did yeah. is i worked yeah yeah that's yeah i i've, I've been in that uh, I, I i loved it i mean yeah. i i knew not only did i know i was doing something special what i was learning the huge amount of technology that i was absorbing and also i knew how to do a lot of things a lot of other people did my my father had a mask business where he made halloween masks uh th those exclusive kind of hair lay hair laid on a mask oh, really? before yeah. don post ever did it was don post to put him out of business because don post bought the rights to him oh. my father didn't have the rights my father worked on some of the original stuff but didn't have any rights to it so Vern he dropped out Vern langdon yeah. Vern langdon was uh don post partner Right. And uh, and he was going to be part, my dad's partner, but he decided not to go with Don Post because he had a more established studio. My dad was living in Laguna Beach. And so then he went into wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Teaching. Yeah. Wrestling. I love it. I mean, he's a man of all, he's a man no. of all trades. He's a very funny guy, yeah, too. Yeah. I met him. I, I was, met him in a weird, uh, weird situation. Yeah. A lovely, uh, lovely gentleman. So, but yeah. So I, it was, it was all about the work back then. Yeah. And did you have children at that point? Or? I did. I yeah. had two boys. In the, living in the they're valley. In, they're in the film business. Just put it, just a little footnote. You've been racist. But because um, Tom used to say that he would have run me over in the 60s if he knew me. Because you were... Because she was a hippie. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> Don't get in front of my tank. No, I, I mean, can imagine. Yeah, no, know. I know. It's You were not a groovy dude. No. You did not know about Dylan. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can only... Yeah, that, I find that fascinating. Fasc I mean, you could have been an... App this was so funny. I'm, I'm, no, this could, is... This you is could have been an absolute moron in the 60s, and you had to come up with something. It was so insanely electric. Yeah. And my cousins 
they listen to Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. Sure. Excuse me? We have the Stones, the Beatles, we have Dylan, we have... I mean, I don't... I mean... I remember hearing the Stones and the Beatles on the radio, but the albums in our house... Uh, the, the, the hippest album in our house was Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. Of course. Yeah. Uh, of course. Whipped Cream and Other Delights. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, which I stared at as a child. Uh, and like Mitch Miller albums. Like, we yeah. Didn't, yeah, we didn't have, we weren't cool at all. Um, but uh, having lived in San Francisco for a couple of years when the dead played in town, I realized that the 60s were also probably profoundly annoying. <laughs> From 64 to 68 to legitimate show business in the press, the Beatles were just annoying. There were there were people like Jack Benny and Bob yeah. Hope would do sketches and terrible wigs. Like they didn't. It wasn't until like six, 69, 70 people started to go. Oh, there might be something here. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. But le, le, so they were still getting over Elvis. You're a pussy cat. You're where it's at. The one that's in on every play. The Ian's out. Big girl. Hmm, beautiful. Now, all of those monster movies that you grew up watching as a kid, Frankenstein, Dracula, The Wolfman, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, they all came from different places. Frankenstein takes place largely in Germany, Dracula in Transylvania, and then the action moves to London. The Wolfman is set in the Welsh countryside, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon is set deep, deep in the dark heart of the Amazon rainforest. But they all had the same home. A swath of land along the Coanga Pass in Burbank, California, called Universal Studios. And Universal Studios had its home in the mind of a German immigrant named Carl Lemley. Lemley was born in Württemberg, Germany, and emigrated to America at the age of 17 in 1884. He scraped by eventually settling in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where he worked as a bookkeeper at the Continental Clothing Company. But Lemley was not satisfied crunching numbers in Wisconsin. He moved to Chicago and opened a movie theater. This brought him into conflict with Thomas Edison. Yep, that Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, along with an employee of his named W.K.L. Dixon, invented the first crude movie camera. It was called the Kinetoscope. And the Kinetoscope was used to show short little film loops that you would watch through a peephole viewer. These were commonly found in penny arcades. Now later, with the help of another inventor named Thomas Ahmet, the Kinetoscope was improved upon and became the Vitascope. Now these could show whole motion pictures, and many had separate sound cylinders mechanically synced with the film reels to give you the illusion of a talking motion picture, years before that was standard practice. But to distribute movies, you needed movies. Enter Thomas Edison, again, who founded Edison Film Studios. The Edison Film Studios made close to 1,200 movies, mostly shorts, and they showed things like acrobats or parades. One incredibly grotesque production is called Electrocuting an Elephant, and that, for some hideous reason, is exactly what it shows. But they also produced narrative films, movies. The first version of The Great Train Robbery was produced by Edison Studios in 1903, a version of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was produced in 1910. As well, in that same year, Thomas Edison produced the very first filmed version of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So, Edison wanted to protect his copyright. He formed the Edison Trust, a conglomeration of nine minor film studios. The Edison Trust not only controlled film supply and distribution... It controlled the sale of raw film stock. If you wanted to show a movie, you had to go to Thomas Edison to get it. You had to go to Thomas Edison to show it. You had to go to Thomas Edison to make it. It was essentially a legal monopoly 
that muscled out independent film production and distribution with multiple patents. Now, a lot of independent film production companies, in an effort to get as far away from Edison's New Jersey headquarters as possible, if only to make it more difficult for him to enforce his patents, moved as far west as the continent allowed, eventually settling in a little community in California known mostly for having a lot of orange groves called Hollywood, California. Lemley, unfortunately, was not that far away. He was just in Chicago, so he had to fight. As part of Lemley's attack on the Edison Trust, he started using the concept of billing the actor first instead of the production company. The concept of a movie star. Carl Lemley also joined the lawsuit against the Edison Trust. In 1915, the United States versus the Edison Trust ended that monopoly. That same year, Lemley, who had since moved to New York and formed a partnership with other independent production companies, moved to Hollywood, where he found a 235-acre spread out in the San Fernando Valley. He started his film studio there, calling it the Universal Film Manufacturing Company. Now, Universal's first big-name star was the silent film superstar Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney, who is probably known today to most people, if anybody, as the father of horror film star Lon Chaney Jr. But Lon Chaney Sr. was a huge, huge, huge movie star in the silent era. When he died, his passing was the headline of that day's New York Times. But that wasn't until 1930. In 1923, Lon Chaney Sr. starred in Universal Pictures' The Hunchback of Notre Dame. This was a monster hit, pun intended, and was followed in 1925 by The Phantom of the Opera, also a monster hit. Another fun fact. At this point in time, the head of production at Universal was a guy named Irving Thalberg. Now, he would soon be lured away by a guy named Louis B. Mayer to work at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. And in turn, Irving Thalberg would become one of the biggest movie moguls in the history of Hollywood. Carl Lemley needed a new man to head the studio. He found the perfect person. Carl Lemley Jr. Well, he was maybe not the perfect person. But he was the perfect person by Carl Lemley's standards. For he possessed the one attribute that Carl admired. He was related to Carl. Carl Lemley was the king of nepotism. At one point, over 70 employees on Universal's payroll were members of the Lemley clan. It led to a common rhyme of the day in the town, Uncle Carl Lemley has a very big family. Carl Lemley Jr. took a good look at what was working for Universal at the box office. He saw Cheney's two big hits, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and the Phantom of the Opera. And so, he set about finding another horror story for his star. In 1924, Bram Stoker's novel Dracula had become a very successful stage play, adapted by two guys named Hamilton Dean and John Balderston. Lemley Jr. snapped it up as a vehicle for his star, Lon Chaney Sr. Only Lon Chaney Sr. decided to die. Or his death was decided for him by his body which had cancer. Despite playing the role to great acclaim on Broadway, the play's star, Bella Lugosi, was not considered for the lead in the film. But Lugosi lobbied hard, and eventually, by sheer tenacity, he won the role. Lon Chaney died, Bella Lugosi became Dracula, and Dracula became a big, big, big hit for Universal Studios. So they went looking for a new property for their new horror star, Bela Lugosi. They settled on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Ironically, Frankenstein had already been made into a movie by Lemley's old nemesis, Thomas Mr. Lightbulb Edison. But Frankenstein was finally ready to become a Universal Studios picture, starring its new horror star, Bela Lugosi. And then, Bella Lugosi turned the part down. 
You know I turned down Frankenstein. What? After I did Dracula, the studio offered me Frankenstein, and I turned it down. The part wasn't sexy enough. Too degrading for a big star like me. Bella, I have 25 scenes to shoot tonight. Oh, sorry, don't let me slow you down. That's, of course, from the brilliant film Ed Wood with Martin Landau in his Oscar-winning performance as Bela Lugosi, and that's pretty much what happened. So director James Whale saw a creepy-looking guy in the studio commissary named Boris Karloff. Karloff had mostly played small roles in gangster films, but Whale thought he had a good look. Makeup genius Jack Pierce turned Boris Karloff into the Frankenstein monster, and that became the monster hit of monster hits. So Universal moved on to another horror story. This one inspired by the current craze in Egyptology, inspired by the 1922 discovery and opening of King Tut's tomb, The Mummy, starring Universal Studios horror star, not Bela Lugosi. It was Boris Karloff, billed simply as Karloff. But oddly, Boris Karloff's The Mummy is pretty much a remake of Bela Lugosi's Dracula. Watch the two films back-to-back, and you will see it's pretty much a retelling of the exact same story with a mummy instead of a vampire. It even uses the same theme music, Swan Lake. Now, other horror hits followed. The Invisible Man, The Raven, Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Bride of Frankenstein, Dracula's Daughter, which came out in 36. And if you watch it now, it's pretty much a Depression-era story about the horrors of lesbianism. But it was another film in 1936 that saw the end of the Lemley family. Carl Lemley Jr. had been, despite his string of horror hits, also responsible for a string of giant, horrible flops. And with the release of 1936's mega-budget remake of Showboat, he had finally succeeded in bankrupting the studio. Both Lemleys were removed from the studio by the board of directors and replaced with a guy named Joe Pasternak, who made musicals. So he took over the studio, and that's what he did. He stopped making horror movies, and he started making musicals. And that's all Universal made for a couple of years. And then in 39, a local theater chain in Los Angeles re-released Dracula and Frankenstein as a double bill, made a ton of money, so the studio said, all right, let's go back to doing that. So they started making sequels to the original films. Films like 1939's The Son of Frankenstein, or new titles like The Wolfman which starred Universal's newest horror star, Creighton Tull Chaney. Who? Exactly. Creighton Tull Chaney was the son of Universal's original horror star, Lon Chaney. But he was his own man, and he wanted to keep his own name. Universal said, no, 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 we want you to be Lon Chaney Jr. And Creighton said, no, thanks. So Universal said, great. Hey, do you know who can star in The Wolfman since we can't seem to cast it? And he said, how about me, Lon Chaney Jr.? And a horror star was born. And the studio that was once run by the son of its founder started making sequels to its original hits starring the son of its former star. And that's why everything in Hollywood is original no matter how many times we make it. Boy, Mr. Lagosi, you must lead such an exciting life. When is your next picture coming out? I have no next picture. You gotta be joking. A great star like you, you must have dozens of them lined up. Back in the old days, yes. Now no one gives two fucks for the bail. Like. But you're a big star. No more. I haven't worked in 40 years. This business, this town, it chews you up, then spits you out. I'm just an ex-boogie man. Make a right. Great story if it ends there, but you know it doesn't. DVDs of The Creature from the Black Lagoon, Planet of the Apes, Dracula, The Wolfman, la la la. Mallory O'Meara's book, The Lady from the Black Lagoon. J.W. Rinsler's jaw-dropping book, The Making of Planet of the Apes, which had stuff in it that I'd never seen. 
my book, Planet of the Apes Visionaries, the graphic novel adaptation of Rod Serling's first draft screenplay, they're all available at Amazon.com. Click on our banner and go ape or creature. Lastly, let me say a word about our Patreon feature. We introduced it late last year, and I could not be more grateful to everyone who signed up. This podcast is unique, and so too is our Patreon feature. We do one episode a month. The show comes out at some point in the last week of the month. It's close to three hours long, which I would hope would tide you over to the next month. Now that will change soon. As I said, I'm looking into ways to get you possibly a more digestible sized version of the show. That's my goal. Half the time, twice the frequency. But remember, at the end of the day, my goal is to get you more of what you want, not less. And if I can do it without talking your ear off about buying some stuff you don't really need, we're all the better for it. In any event, just five bucks a month earns you the title Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet. For this, you get access every month to extra video, bonus audio content, behind-the-scenes videos of the recording of the show, etc., etc., etc. We wanted to make it worth your while, but not make it too burdensome. So there you go. Just go to DanaGould.com, click on our Patreon link, and for $5 a month, it's like I'm with you all the time. In the car. In the tub. On the toilet. Just you and me. For links to all of this nonsense, go to DanaGould.com. Hey, are you tired of listening to this bullshit? I know I am. Symbols. We're all familiar with them. There are shortcuts to vital information. That's why, to familiarize you with the movie rating symbols, which will be used by this theater, we present the following guide for parents and young people. It is designed to inform parents about the suitability of movie content for viewing by their children. G. All ages admitted, general audiences. GP. All ages admitted, parental guidance suggested. R. Restricted. Under 17 requires accompanying parent or adult guardian. X. No one under 17 admitted. Here's a manly thing that I don't get. Giving your son your name and then making him add junior to the end of it. Just a simple, easy way of ensuring your child go through their entire life feeling that they are, at best, nothing more than a lesser version of you. To men who would do this to their children, I say, get over yourself. You had an orgasm. It's no great achievement. Think about the life sentence that is the name Frank Sinatra Jr. How is that anything other than child abuse? It's as if John Lennon made his son perform in a band, but he forced them to call themselves the other Beatles. Good luck, guys. Now, there is one famous junior who wanted nothing to do with his father's name, in fact, he wasn't even born with it. He was forced to take it later in life just to put food on the table. Lon Chaney Jr., the star of the original The Wolfman. He was born Creighton Tull Chaney. Now, he was the son of Lon Chaney, who we will now call Lon Chaney Sr., who was known across the globe in the 1920s as the Man of a Thousand Faces. Lon Chaney Sr. was one of the biggest movie stars of the silent era. So famous, in fact, that when he died in 1930, his passing did not just make the front page of the New York Times. It was the headline. Creighton Tull Chaney had some daddy issues, believe you me. In fact, he didn't even think about going into acting until after his dad was safe in the ground. The name Junior didn't come until studio heads at Universal convinced him that after years of struggling as Creighton, he could increase his income by about a million percent by changing his name to his dad's. So he did, around 1935. And he never forgave himself. Despite scoring a pretty big win as the simpleton Lenny in 1939's Of Mice and Men with Burgess Meredith, Lon Jr. spent his early career giving uninspired performances in uninspired westerns. Unlike his father, who was a flamboyant theatrical artiste, Lon Jr. fancied himself just a regular Joe, a ham and egger. He liked nothing more than drinking, wrestling, drinking, and drinking, and drinking. 
This might not have helped his liver much, but it did lead to the performance that would define his career. In 1941, Lon Chaney Jr. won the role of Larry Talbot, otherwise known to the world as the Wolfman. And he gave the role a sense of emotional heft that towered over any other performance he would ever give. Larry Talbot knew that when the moon was full, he was powerless over his actions, and he would wake up the next morning in disheveled clothes, not knowing what he did or where he'd been. For Lon, who waged a lifelong battle with very real liquid demons, the role fit him like a beer koozie. Now, when I was a kid, the Wolfman was my favorite monster. You see, unlike Godzilla or Frankenstein or even King Kong, who you could say are about anarchy, just smashing things, the Wolfman is about guilt, shame and guilt. And I can relate. On the one hand, I was raised a very strict Catholic. And on the other hand, well, you can imagine what was going on in the other hand, hence all the shame and guilt. Now, if you haven't seen the original 1941 version of The Wolfman, or if you haven't seen it in a long time, you should give it a look. It's great. There are some goofy things. For one, in the movie, Larry Talbot is the son of an English nobleman, Sir John Talbot, played by Claude Rains. No, Larry, but isn't it a sad commentary on our relationship that it took a hunting accident and your brother's death to bring you? That is Sir John Talbot. And now here is his son. Listen to Lon Chaney Jr.'s expert British accent. Well, it really isn't as bad as it sounds. I watched every bit of news about you. I was mighty proud when you won the Belden Prize for research. My God, he sounds just like Ringo. The Wolfman is full of father-son conflicts. Here's a spoiler alert. It's Larry's own father in the film who kills his son in the end. But the movie made Lon a star. And over the course of the next few years, Lon Chaney Jr. played every monster Universal Studios had. Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy. And he brought to those roles pretty much nothing. His job in the Frankenstein and the mummy movies was to just walk around. And he did literally that. Giving the roles none of the silent poetry that Boris Karloff seemed to so effortlessly give them. But every time he played the Wolfman, which he did four more times in the 1940s, that oh-so-haunted look would return to those big, sad, rummy eyes, and he knocked it out of the park every time. Lon Chaney Jr. ended his career in schlocky B-movies, stuff like 1959's The Alligator People, where he has classic lines like, Dirty, stinking, slimy gators. You bit my hand off, didn't you? Well, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life killing gators. The rest of my life. Seems like an odd thing to dedicate yourself to. I ain't never gonna stop shooting gators. You know what I think is a fun hobby? Doing puzzles. I ain't never gonna stop shooting gators! There's another great bit in here that I'm going to throw in, apropos of nothing. When the heroine of the film realizes the result of the mad scientist's evil experiments. Your patients are turning into alligators. Alligator people. Oh, alligator people. See, if they were just alligators, that would be fucked up. Lon Chaney Jr. died of heart failure in 1973. Because silent movies are not really enjoyed in the masses, he has easily eclipsed his father in the fame department, although Lord only knows what was going on in that head of his. His friends describe him as a sweet, yet terribly sad man. The way you walked was thorny, through no fault of your own. But as the rain enters the soil... The river enters the sea, so tears run to a predestined end. Ah, the Wolfman. You gotta see it. I ain't never gonna stop shooting gators! I know. I know. John Chambers is hired. You you read this script for Planet of the Apes. Mm-hmm. John Chambers chooses you to work with him because that wasn't the uh, it was that wasn't uh, a, a, an automatic. Yeah. yeah. Well, he he knew what I knew, so he knew I could assist him, and mm-hmm. he knew that he could pretty much teach me what he knew because I already had you know I was already working with the materials and and whatnot. So yeah. And we should also bring in Will Conlon, who directed the the documentary. 
John Chambers, for, for people who, uh, who might not, uh, realize that this is the person we're talking about. If you saw the film Argo with Ben Affleck, John Chambers is who John Goodman was portraying. Correct. Uh, he was, and, and, and I include you in this as well, Tom. What, what's amazing about this, what, when makeup makes this leap is that you're artists, you're sculptors, and you have a fully fledged artistic sense and execution, but you're also chemists. You know, you have to learn mm-hmm. how to pour and make latex <laughs> you know, and rubber and operate kilns and things like that. You know, there's a lot of chemistry that, that, that goes into that job. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's two, it, it, it's two different, it's, it's two different, uh, totally, uh, contrary disciplines. Uh, Chambers, from what I understand and correct me if I'm wrong, he started working in the military, uh, well, making when, limbs for soldiers. That well, were, when he, when he got out of, uh, uh, high school, he, uh, he went to, uh, um, he went to another, uh, technical school on doing textile designs, mm-hmm. then got drafted in the army. When he went in the army, he became a dental technician. They trained him as a dental technician, and he learned that. And then he got. As How do you a, get that gig? I would have been. You're a bullet stopper. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> he just he knew enough thing? about he knew enough about certain it, because he had artistic uh, talent. They, you mm-hmm. know, he makes sure. dentures and things like that. And then that was also the same department that did maxillofacial facial restoration. Right. For people who lost ears and noses and things like that yeah. in combat. And so when he got out of the army, he went to where he worked at Vans, uh, uh, hospital and, and, uh, veterans hospital. And he, he specialized in, uh, doing, uh, pro- prosthetics for people, not so much losing limbs, but facial pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And so he could combine, he did gorgeous. That work was, he did was just beautiful and uh he'd glass eyes and 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 not just yeah. teeth but the whole yeah no there was the there was a yeah. guy in my hometown who I mean, people forget you know you lose your face you know there was a guy in our my hometown who the story is uh it was in a foxhole the explosive was in it he put his helmet over it and you know he didn't look great and uh, yeah, John always told me the story about. I always said, "Well, doesn't this stuff bother?" Because I helped him with a few of those patients later on. Because he still did that. He still did it for for the county and whatnot. Right. And uh, I, I said, "Doesn't ever bother." And he's the only one ever really bothered me. Is this twenty year old kid that had lost his whole face, and so he, from photographs, made a mask that fit on him that looked like him. And when he got off the plane, his mother took one look at him, keeled right over, and had a heart attack and died. Ugh. And the guy went up on top of a four-story building and jumped off. Yeah. So that was his background. Yeah, not fooling around. Yeah. Um, and so he, when did he start working for the CIA? We opened, he started in 1972, and then we opened up the very first makeup, independent makeup studio to do that work. Mm-hmm. And we we did it for probably almost a year before he decided he wanted out. And- John was such a fascinating figure. We had to find the balance of making him both a mentor figure to Tom and not a Bond villain. Uh-huh. This, uh, is Bill, this is Bill Conlon who directed the documentary Making Apes. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, you do. It's almost safe to say, like, you know, John Chambers had a Phil Spector level of talent. And a Phil Spector level of crazy, although he never shot anybody. <laughs> but, uh, and I often say this too, like, yeah, well, the same brain that makes the good stuff makes the bad stuff. <laughs> and if you get really potent good stuff, you're going to get really potent bad stuff. Yeah. You know, um, Pat Boone is, uh, doesn't get that angry, doesn't get that brilliant. He's just Pat Boone. <laughs> John Chambers... <laughs> You get the highs and the lows. Yeah. So he didn't start. So when you were after Planet of the Apes, you guys get very successful. You form this company, and 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 we're going to. But and that's when the Central Intelligence Agency says, "Hey, we need you guys to make field kits for our agents." Well, we didn't necessarily make field kits. Our big job was um, our main job was making masks that they could do quick changes. 
So they did these overhead masks that hair and everything on them that would tuck underneath your collar. And so if you were being followed, let's say, by the KGB in Prague back then, and and uh, they wanted to, wanted you to disappear, what they would do is you'd step into a little store. You had a couple agents waiting. They had a clothing change, and they had this mask. They'd slip over the head, boom, throw it within less than five minutes. The guy could turn back, back, walk back and walk back out, and the tail would not notice that's who it was. And they would lose. That was mostly what we did. Wow. And we changed ethnicity, ethnicities on people and, you know, make white and the black folks right. or a- Asian people, that sort of thing. Did you do, were there disguise kits in the field, like Mission Impossible? They had their own kits. I, I, I loved it because these guys would bring in their, the, the old CIA guys back then were guys, a lot of them that came all the way from the Second World War. Right. They were old timers. They knew how the world worked. They yeah. knew yeah, all, yeah, yeah. they knew all the, un, the underbelly is what they knew. Yeah. When the and CIA was, what's interesting OSS, is, I yeah, it, what's interesting, the first Bush, he got, who was in charge of CIA, yeah. decided because since the, 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 the wall came down, he would, uh, he would get rid of some of those old guys because they were seedy old guys. They weren't, they were embarrassment. They were, you could right. smell alcohol in them at yeah, yeah, yeah. five o'clock in the morning. You had, to burn your eyes, right? Right. And uh, and then it was uh, Clinton who got rid of the the uh, the rest of them and mm-hmm. these old guys because they came back after the after a, a nine. 9-11 and talked to me and one of the guys I knew from way back then says it's not the CIA that they used to have if they had those old guys still in it they would have known this was going to happen yeah so it was interesting it was yeah. really interesting to yeah. work with people the like world's that. a nasty place hear the stories that were fascinating um, there's a great book called Legacy of Ashes written by Tim Weiner W-E-I-N-E-R and it's just the history of the CIA yeah and it's fascinating and and the the title comes from at the end of eisenhower's second term he brought in john foster dulles or alan dulles john foster dulles was his brother but he had a different position alan dulles was the head of the cia and eisenhower reamed him and said you've left me a legacy of ashes and just because they because the cia had them (laughs) up until recently like a 90 percent failure rate (laughs) like it would just and then stunning successes but all of these other yeah um uh it's a really really fascinating uh, it's and it you know as you as you learn from talking about john chambers nothing in movies can compare to real life no the stories are crazy uh, and and one of the fun things when we were making this too is I, I cold called the CIA to see if we could get them involved because we wanted to talk to uh, Tony Mendez. Yeah. Um, but of course, who just, passed- who just passed away, so he was in very poor health. That's why we wouldn't, oh, weren't able to get a hold of him. But um, yeah, I, I called the National Spy Museum because um, we were trying to find out if they had any materials of Chambers, any photos that we hadn't seen. I think you know a lot of the Chambers materials kind of out there, so we were looking for any new stuff uh, mm-hmm. to reveal. And I get on the phone with the National Spy Museum, like, please hold, we're going to transfer you to the cia okay all right thank you wow so now i've got a file i'm sure somewhere yeah good <laughs> jo- john chambers never used his real name when he worked at the cia he called himself jeremy calloway that's fantastic. he was so paranoid yeah i he get would, it yeah. yeah he didn't want somebody he was an absolute paranoid person tommy they're going to get your name tommy who the commies oh my god i said <laughs> i've never even met one <laughs> don't get funny with me tommy And then Camille Rossi would tell his family bad things about her. So this was the model that she was yeah. learning when she was a kid, that it's not okay for a woman to be able to say like stuff like that to a man. And when Camille Rossi was ultimately fired, because Julia Morgan had enough, you know, she there was a period of time where he was just so bad. And Julia Morgan wrote to Rand- William Randolph first and basically sa- said, it's him or me. Yeah. And for, for the, you know, in, in, in construction, as somebody that's remodeled a couple of houses in my day uh you know the architect is the boss and then the construction engineer basically does what yeah. the architect says and he was constantly going around julia to, to no you don't need to do it uh, listen to me uh, uh, yeah it, it's infuriating yeah infuriating. so he got fired but he told his family that there that that's not why he was leaving. They had all these other reasons, like, oh, they ran out of money, we have a better job somewhere else, even though Julia Morgan helped him find another job. So ju- this is what Millicent's mm-hmm. 
template was when she was a kid for, you know, a man and men and women working together. And that really came back to bite her when this happened with Bud Westmore. And I really think that's why, I mean, also what could she have done? You know, we don't, there was no Twitter back then. There was no, (laughs) you know, we can't call people out. So there wasn't a lot that she could have done anyway, but I, she just gave up. Yeah, it is. It is. it, it, It is infuriating. And, and just the psychology of it, not only, with the way she reacted to Bud Westmore, but the, the men in her life. One, she was not able to have ki- uh, children because of a burst appendix yeah. as a child yep. that went untreated for three weeks because a male doctor said she's got the flu. Yeah. And everyone said, okay. And yeah, for three weeks. It's amazing she lived. Yeah, she almost didn't. She uh, got peritonitis. Yeah, you get sepsis from that. Yeah, it was crazy. Your so she couldn't have kids. Your body's full of bile. Yeah. Which is fun you know which is my tinder profile <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, get the monster girls and so, <laughs> i'm not on tinder <laughs> uh that's really where the monsters are and I, so i've heard i've, I've been i've been mir- uh, miraculously exempt uh so she couldn't have kids i meet women the old-fashioned way by lurking in, in the a well far end of the parking lot at the mall <laughs> <laughs> with a slurpee <laughs> yeah. a lot of time uh, you know what i do what i find in you know meeting women women like women like a couple things men with uh their shirt tucked into shorts <laughs> oh boy black socks in 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 sandals Mm-hmm. And a fanny pack. I'm just going to say, you have to have the fanny pack, yeah. the full trifecta. That's it. How, hold on. How far are those pants pulled up, though? Oh, they're 40s. 40s okay, level good. Above okay, the okay navel. good. Because that's really the, that's, 40s level that's how the take it, you take it over the edge. Yeah. <laughs> and the opening line is always, oh, I can't believe you're so stupid. <laughs> First of all. <laughs> well, actually. Uh, yeah, actually. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> oh, that's, it's been, I, I got, actually. I finally got into my first argument with a man on this book tour about Creature from the Black Lagoon. That's my new favorite thing. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> what was the argument? Oh, he, he, it was in, he was in the audience and kept asking, try, he was trying to ask me about. Where is this? Uh, oh, this was in LA. I think he was trying to ask a legitimate question, but he started out by saying, well, you know, there's this perception that women, there's not enough women in Hollywood. And I, I interrupted him. And I was like, no, there's not a perception, dude. It's like a numbers thing. It's very obvious. And he was like, well, no, it's really your perception. And I was like, no, no. And I'm on stage with right. a microphone. He's right. there to see me talk. And right. he just keeps pushing back and arguing with me. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what to tell you. Well, that's the whole new, that, that is one of the great gifts of our Trumpian era is there is no reality. It's all just how you see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My favorite is when I do interviews and people start asking me creature trivia so I can prove my worth. Like, motherfucker, I wrote a book on it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just trust that I have you a basic think? knowledge or someone who asked me, did you know two different guys played the creature? <laughs> Like, yeah, I do know. <laughs> That's amazing. I do know that. Thanks so much for pointing it out. But yeah. it's, a, it's, and I get it. You know, there's monster people. There's this outsider culture. We're really all, you know, we are the people who everyone else excludes from things. Yeah. So we, we have this urge to do it to other people, but it's stupid. It is. And it, it, you know, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird way to work. I, I, I was telling this to somebody else. If I tweet to a million people, I like the color yellow. Half a million people will go, yellow sucks, you fucking asshole. Yeah, kill yourself. Yellow is terrible. Green is better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That happens in the genre all the time. I was hosting a panel for the new Mystery Science Theater with Jonah and and Patton and everybody. And these people are all my friends. Mm -hmm. And, And Joel is my friend from before Mystery Science Theater, like. And one of the questions is like, um, how much freedom did you get f- doing the show, or how much were you under the iron fist of Joel Hodgson? It's like, no, no, Joel isn't the villain just because every situation needs a villain. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like Joel is the, Joel is not the iron. Fist. <laughs> but Jesus. no, of course you would say that because uh, you know everybody in authority is my parents. Mm-hmm. I have to hate my. So it's like you can't just have a clean. Yeah. Story like, no, we all like the same thing. We're all doing this because we like it. Yeah. Well, people are always looking for that controversy and they really, you know, they have a hard time thinking that everyone, it's possible for everyone to just like make a thing and get along and not hate each other. Yeah. It's crazy. I I worked, I was a writer on The Simpsons for a long time and people would say like, oh, The Simpsons isn't what it used to be. 
Yes. That started in season three. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and also like you know? things change. You yeah. can't have the same thing forever. Yeah. Things you just cha- can't. Yeah. Things change. And uh, yeah, well, that's, you know, that's my whole gripe about in stand up comedy, cultural appropriation. Oh, so I can't do it a black guy anymore on stage? No. Like, you know, you can't. But also, you know how many other people you can still make fun of? <laughs> but it's just it, like, yeah, progress. Things change. It's all, to me, a, it's a lack of creativity. Like, that's the, your crutch. Yeah. You got this one thing that you can't yeah. make fun of. And, oh, no, now I can't do comedy you anymore. You also have a complete set of encyclopedias in your pocket. Yeah. You know, things you're, change. You're carrying the entire world's storage of information around <laughs> in the palm of your hand. And you yeah. can't figure out a single other thing to do comedy about. <laughs> Come on, dude. Seriously. Really it's insane to me. True. It's very true. Just like get, just like think a little bit. You know, we have the most. Like, there's so many people that you can punch up to and make fun of. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm guilty. By the way, I'm guilty. I've I've transgressed every rule. I've I've made. And, yeah. I've said horrible. I've said horrible things. We all. Like, but the, but the, the, it's not the not saying horrible things. That's the part that we need to focus on. It's the progress that we need to focus yeah. on. You know, yeah. we're all trying to not be garbage people every day. Yeah. That's that's the that's the goal is to just not be a piece of shit. And everyone stumbles. And you know, even like. You know, early on when I was, I, I got my start doing Lovecraft convention stuff. Lovecraft, who was a garbage person, who was afraid of black right. people. Yeah, well, I know the name. Was it, was he the one that had the dog? No, the cat. Yeah. The cat that right. you're thinking of. Yeah. But, and then it, it took me about a year of, of, of like working and living in that world before going, wow, this guy fucking sucks. Yeah. Man, yeah. and I'm a stupid white chick who just does, doesn't have to think about it because I'm white. Now, have you seen Jeffrey Combs' show about Lovecraft? Yeah, uh, I haven't seen it live, but I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I wonder if he touches on that at all. That'd be interesting to see. But yeah, it's really, it's just about not work going forward and trying not to be a piece of shit. Yeah, it's just, that's all. That's just all. Trying. Just trying not to be garbage people. I was talking to John and B. Joe Trimble, who are the people that... They started the letter campaign at the end of season two of Star Trek that got it picked up for a season three, which is the reason Star oh, Trek awesome. went into syndication and became what it was. They really are a nice couple from California in the 60s that saved Star Trek. Amazing. And she was telling, you know, they're giants in fandom. They're still around. They're very sweet. And Mil- and B. Joe was telling me that, uh, you know, she was at a convention and there was a woman dressed as Wonder Woman, but she was overweight and somebody said a shitty thing. And she was like, are, are you mean to everybody or just people dressed as Wonder Woman? And it's like, it was so That's well amazing. put. It was so well put. Well, that that brings us all the way back around to just like, why are we doing this to ourselves? You know, instead of like when you're posting the color yellow and someone, every other one should be like, wow, col- colors are cool. Yeah. It's cool that you like yellow. So we have this this mad genius, John Chambers. He hires you, and he looks at Ben Nye's old lab and says, get everything out of here. Yeah. And this is on the Fox lot. Yeah. In the spring of 66. Six. Um, you cl- clear everything out. So 60, 67. Six, or, or, 67. Yeah, yeah it was 67. Yeah. Here's, here's what I don't understand. And the film started shooting in May of 1967. Yes. I, I see in my n- nerdy deep dives makeup tests that are from, like, April. And it's not there yet. Yeah. Uh, the one where they're all in white lab coats. Yeah. Yeah. It ain't there. No. That ain't it. But they're but they're spending money. Corn is growing at Malibu Creek <laughs> State Park. They're building um, the city bedrock, and uh, and and uh, were you? Did you just you? Did you know you were going to get there? Did you? Was there like when those tests came back where they're all in the white lab coats? Is we're like, no, this ain't it. We shoot in six weeks, guys. What do you like? You know, I don't remember. Thinking about that for myself, I'm sure we John didn't did. Have time to think. No, about I, I was just always busy. But those those first people that were uh, there were we we the first people that we used were um, uh, George Sasaki was Japanese, uh, uh, Joe Wong who was um, Chinese, and the other girl Erin, I think she was Philip Philippine Filipina. 
And then we had this one guy. They, oh, we cast a black guy to do the gorilla, be the gorilla. But when the studio saw that, they they went crazy. Oh my God, you can't do that. Yeah, you know? sixty six. Yeah, sixty six. So we we had this big kind of big heavy muscle bodybuilding a Jewish guy named Paul, I think his name was. Yeah. Totally wrong for the gorilla. He had kind of a pinched face. Wrong for that kind of face. And John wanted people with small features so he could because he had to build out. You can't take away. And so those first tests you saw with the lab coat were as, or, or was uh, George Sasaki and Erlen, but we didn't have the hair pieces made yet. Those hair, that all hair was just laid on, and we were just experimenting with it. What I find fascinating is it's it's a big budget movie, and Charlton Heston is a big movie star, and Fox is on wobbly legs, and they've got a lot riding on this, and. You're two, you six guys in the lab, and if you don't produce, it's a mega disaster. We have to kill ourselves. Well, if the if the makeup didn't work, that movie would either they would have pulled the plug on it, or they would have made it, and it would have been a laughing scene, and it would have crushed Charlton Heston's career, <laughs> would have crushed Frank Schaffner's career, like you know. Uh, you really have to admire the. I, I mean, maybe did did John, did John Chambers just instill that much faith in people, like, or or did they just like went they just went with it, like, no, it'll, we believe we'll get there. We'll believe we'll get there. I know that uh, Richard Zanuck was the guy behind it. He yeah. liked it. The rest of the studio didn't want it. They, they they every time they went to a meeting, they were you know they were pissed off they were having to spend this money it was a waste of time they didn't believe in it whatsoever so but john always knew and we all had faith in him he was such a kind of a bombastic uh sure-footed person that right you you didn't and doubt you need, him you need yeah you need yeah. Oh, you, yeah yeah <laughs> you know? exactly yeah you needed patent and that's yeah. what he was and yeah. uh and the rest of us were just his worker bees and we were madly going as many hours as we could work a day and yeah. plus weekends we that's what we did. And the final sculpting that we now accept as the the sort of the, the look of the apes from Planet of the Apes, was that all John or is that a combination of John and some of the other guys in the lab? Or, well, John, you can see it. John, fine. John sculpted all of the principles and he had a, a, a lady that worked at Don Post Studios before named Pat Newman, who did the other people. And she did all of her sculptures from his sculptures. Mm-hmm. He, he would, you know, stay with her and, yeah. and make sure she, had, but, and she was a brilliant sculptress. And, and, uh, uh, the only other person that ever sculpted anything was I, I sculpted a, a mock-up of a gorilla. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just a, you know, kid, and and uh, that that caused a bunch of commotion. Because yeah, the, d- tell that it, story because it didn't go over well with John Chambers, and it's a great no. window into what a benevolent boss he must have been. Well, I, I I asked him if I could sculpt a gorilla, and he said, "Yeah, do it in the back room, Tommy. I don't want anybody to, you know, I don't want because I don't want to confuse what I'm doing here." So I did that, and uh, uh, Arthur Jacobs and and. Uh, Mort Abrams. Mort Abrams came in to take a look at what he was doing, and they they said they'd be by that day. And so I madly rushed up and got John, brought him back, and they were looking at his stuff. and And you can see some of the first tests. the The nose was kind of a pinched, more ape looking yeah, nose. Flatter. And they were worried that someone like Kim Hunter, who they were talking to at that time, would never want to wear something that would make her look ugly. Yeah. And so because the chimpanzees ended up with cat noses. Yeah, exactly. They're, That's they're what kinda, they did. I mean, it's. It worked. So, so yeah. So, uh, 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 Mort Abrams walked in the back room and he saw the sculpture I was doing. And it, as I said, it wasn't very good, but it, but it, it, it was more of a kind of an evolutionary ape. Mm-hmm. And they they decided they, they liked that they liked it. it was a little more a little softer and whatnot and they said well, a little of this would be perfect for what we are doing out there and Chambers <laughs> he, he had a, he had a meltdown on me and threw me out of the lab and barred me from there but I was his only help I was the only one in that lab right. with him for the first uh, for the first probably month. There was nobody else in there, just he and I. Did he call you a lunch pail? He called me a lunch bucket. What's that mean? A lunch bucket. For him, a lunch bucket was one of those, uh, a guy that worked from, uh, you work from nine to five in a factory, Uh you know, and the the whistle goes off, you eat your lunch. And and if you were an entrepreneur, you were uh, Joe Bananas. (laughs) 
Either a Joe Bananas or a lunch bucket. <laughs> That's fantastic. And he, and he, and he le- smashed your sculpture, didn't he? Yeah, and he told me I had a big, greasy fucking thumb. <laughs> and he took my, my sculpture and smashed it and threw me out of the lab. And you didn't get in until you posted a photo of you. Well, on the I drew cross? a I drew a picture of myself hanging on the on on the cross and said, <laughs> and I had a caption on it. I can laugh when things aren't funny. And he came in. He wanted to chew, he wanted to catch me doing something really bad because he was seething. He just couldn't let it go. Yeah, and he I saw that. yeah he he saw that sketch and he just laughed and he told me to get back in the lab and we never we never talked about it ever again. Yeah. Well, you know what Irish Alzheimer's is. Yeah. <laughs> Forget everything but a grudge. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's that's, that's and and then and then one of the things that you talked about in the, in the film will that I was not aware of is uh, that John Chambers had the right to call cut on a set. Yeah, it's, it's which is unheard of. It, it shows a, a tremendous amount of faith in Franklin Schaffner, and obviously he went from Planet of the Apes right into Patton, won the Academy Award for Best but, Director. I think and he Planet was, of the Apes was his first sort of big. Sh- I mean, he'd made The Warlord and he'd made a, t- a lot of television, but but it was a, this was like okay, see if you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess John, from the interview that we have with John that we that was given to us by Scott Espin, it was recorded in 1997 at his at John's 75th birthday party. Um, John had a lot of respect for Franklin, and they had mutual respect because they both came from television. All right? Did so they he, know each other before, like in New York, or from live TV days, or? Had they not met each I, other? I don't believe so because I don't think John ever was in New York. John went from Chicago right to California. But also, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's 1967. It's the summer of love. And John Chambers, Franklin Schaffner, and Charlton Heston are all old, hardcore, World War II conservatives. Yeah. Like they also had that, that going for them. Correct. Like it was them against the world. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and But... You have to, what we what we call a conservative now, what we can call a conservative then, very very different. Um, you know, they were they were they were they were tough guys. Yeah, they were men, men, men's men. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I also think that there was there was a lot of that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna. Well, you know, if if you look in the makeup department, you'll see people like Roy Stork. Ray Stark, a makeup artist, was on the Doolittle raids when they. Wow, when they, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and had to bail out over China. We yeah. got a, a, a Terry Smith, who was a decorated uh, uh, Nick Marcelino, who took over from Bud Westmore, was a decorated Marine from Guadalcanal. Yeah. Leo Latito, a decorated Marine from Guadalcanal, also. And there were a number of uh, the studios hi- hired people coming out of the service, especially people who were especially decorated for heroism. Right. And there were a lot of makeup artists like that. It was, yeah. a, it was, there was, it was, uh, uh, the studios I think were much more, uh, uh, conservative than they are today. They're M- much, by, much by, more. Yeah. It was also a different era. I mean, these are sure. guys that were, that were, their coming of ages during world war two. Yes. You know, uh, you know, it's just a different, you can't apply it, but it, it, it absolutely, I mean, this was real money. Lou, Lou Wasserman who ran, universal uh he famously like he literally was friends with gangsters and he was in cuba with like you know the original cosa nostra and he was like the batista yeah but he said like why did you build all these casinos why did you come down here and build these casinos and i I forget who it was but the story the guy goes like well uh, joey five fingers likes to fish (laughs) and we had nothing to do at night so we built these casinos <laughs> yeah, like these were guys. These were the original sort of chess chess players. Yeah. Okay. Angie the Ox wasn't busy. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. It's uh, and uh, and uh, Cham. Uh, I remember an interview with Chambers where he sort of rolled his eyes at at Heston. What was how was he to deal with? Well, Charlton Heston did some. You know. It, I- by the way, I, I think it, he, you can say it and then tell me to cut it. I've told no, my own Charl- thing. Charlton we Heston. can tell the story that we cut ended up cutting from the doc, too. I can tell my uh, Charl- Charlton Heston Charlton story. Hest- Charlton Heston, uh, um, John knew him from, from NBC. Right. They'd worked together. And so uh, Charlton Heston came in one day and... and uh, Let's hold it for this. Sure. This is, is going to be good. 
thing about that time too that I think is so crazy is like you know the apprentices they all had to have the ties and the dress shirts I love, I love that I miss yeah. that I miss yeah. that I see people on the, you know I'm, uh, I see people on the airplane with flip flops and oh shorts I'm like dude you're in public <laughs> put on some clothes when I saw <laughs> when I saw Hamilton at the Pantages last year the guy next to me was wearing shorts. This, people were wearing. There should be a trap door. People were wearing shorts and flip flops to go walk by Reagan's casket. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was Lyman State. Now the first time I ever vo- the first time I ever voted was against Reagan. <laughs> you know, I proudly cast my vote for Mondale. We'll see what that did. <laughs> but oh, but, you were the one. That was, that was the one. Message. That was your vote. I, it would be very interesting to find out the psychology of specifically Twitter, which is a, a, a sewage gate. Yeah. Um, that there's something about the anonymity of a keyboard, the way that uh, the focus of it, that it, it's almost, I, I've gone at people on Twitter with like, you know, had, had you know, political, sometimes, sometimes it's hard not to say something. Baloney. Yeah. And and I'm a comedian too, so it's also part of my job. You know, you 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 know the, the I think this you suck, you suck, you suck, you suck. And then, well, actually, I think this. Oh, I think this. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And then and then you're we're only three or four things away from. I had a guy come up to me on on a, after a show once and said, "Hey, you blocked me on Twitter, man. Unblock me." No, and I was just like, no. If I blocked you, it's because you said something really. Yeah, vile. that's the that's the worst is when people ask you in yeah, person. But, but, but to them, but Tim was like, it's just a game. I said, I don't mean it. How you do? You're really funny. Yeah, that the, the, there's a great new show on Hulu, Shrill, where she inter. There's a, the, the last scene of the show, or one of the last parts of the show. She inter. She finds the address the of a troll uh-huh. and talks to him, and you can tell that they, he just doesn't realize that him telling her to kill herself every day, calling her a fat cow that needs to die, actually has an effect. And that's what people don't realize. Like, men on Twitter actually have an effect on me. Yeah. That's why I have my contact form on my website. You can't DM me, because my DM inbox would be full of penises. Like, I don't check Twitter, I don't check uh, Instagram DM requests. Good this sort Because I don't, because it's men telling, men sending me pictures of their penises. Men. <laughs> <That's> so <laughs> it's, insane it's so insane. I know I'm a generation past it. And I might, I have to have this conversation with my daughters, because my oldest daughters, I have a nine-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 16-year-old. And I'm like, they're oh, right luck. there. And I'm just like, oh. Yeah. But the, I mean, there are ways you, you can protect yourself, but these guys don't realize that they're literally affecting people's lives. You know? Who wants to see? But it's, it's either Nobody it's either dicks say. or someone telling me that I you know shouldn't be writing yeah, this yeah, book yeah. that I don't belong in this people world. Actually, like, people get angry at you for writing a book about the creature from the black. Lagoon. I started getting hate mail about this book before I even wrote it. Why? I don't understand. Because they don't want to believe a woman designed their favorite uh, monster. Good lord! They think that she was just somebody's girlfriend. That she was really a hot. And I had male historians telling me stuff like this. I got I got hate mail from a woman yesterday who said that she le- loved the book, but I shouldn't talk about Republican lawmakers in it because it's unnecessary. Bitch, I wrote the book. I had to get to decide what's necessary in it. Exactly. Write your book. <laughs> yeah. Your book. Wow. I, I, I had no idea. I also never... I just don't look at those comments. Anyway. No, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I have haven't, never looked on my Amazon reviews. I've never looked on my Goodreads reviews. I don't. My DMs are not open on anything. I have just hired someone I to read my emails. About that. Yeah, it's really crazy. Uh, when I first started writing this, I had so many people tell me. David Scow, our mutual friend, yeah. was one of the only ones who said, "Yeah, you should write this book." Other people said, "No, I don't think she did anything. I don't think she, I think the mythology surrounding her is false because people want to believe that a woman can do this stuff, but she can't." You know, it's really crazy. And it, well, the good thing about it was it just made me more mad. And yeah, I, that's a great motivator. And I was like, We're, "Okay, fuck you. I'm going to write this book." Mm-hmm. And Anger can be power. You know that you can use it, Joe Strong. Uh, I rode um, rode that bad boy all the way to the end of writing this book. Right, and was it your? Um, how did you come about? How did you come up with the the, the two? Was it was the two pronged story conscious? No. It didn't start out that way. It started out as a straight biography, and a couple of things made me want to change it. One, I started uh, listening to—I'm a big audiobook person, and I listened to this 18-hour-long 
uh, biography of Shirley Jackson, who's my favorite yeah. writer. And I listened to this 18 hour long audio book and I thought this was great. And the only reason I got through it is because I love Shirley Jackson and I know all about her. You know, you get to know what brand of underpants that Shirley Jackson liked to wear. And I realized enough, same as me. Yeah. That's what you got to wear the special writer <laughs> underpants. <laughs> that's the way all the power comes from and pull them up high. And I realized that I couldn't I'm, do I'm wearing Isaac Asimov's underwear. <laughs> Let's get at it. <laughs> I couldn't do that with Millicent because no one who the f- no no one knew who the fuck she was. Right. I had to give people a reason to care about her. Yeah. And I also talked to. I think all of us nerds need at least one normal friend to balance you out a little bit. And my my normal friend Kate said, "Why should I read this book if I don't care about Creature from the Black Lagoon?" And I said to her immediately, uh, "You should care about her because this what happened to Millicent Patrick is still happening right now." And she said, "You have to find a way to put that in the book." I'll, uh, and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you something else. Um, when I think about the book, the creature does is nothing that I think about because there's so much other parts of it's her life. Not, it, it's yeah, her life. Her life is fascinating, and yeah. and 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 we should say she she did live by and large happily ever after. I mean, she she yes, she did have a, a, a lot a, of tragedy, a, a lot of tragedy, and an interesting life. But she was not destitute. Nope. She. Um, she well, was she was proud of her partner. life. <laughs> she was proud of her life. Yeah. You know, she really was happy with the way that her life went. Yeah. And the best way I knew how to make that urgent for people was to put in my own stories. Because I could say, you know what? Here's this thing that happened to Millicent in 1954. Here's another story from two years ago from my own life to yes, show that yeah, it's still that, happening. And, and that's great. And, and, and I also love, you know, the, the, it's a detective story. Yes. Well, I wanted people... Uh, the Mormon church figures oh, heavily boy. in this book. Can't wait till I'm dead and I get to be a Mormon ghost bride. That's yeah. going to be fun. Tell, tell, that, tell, that, uh, tell that story. So, well, if I you're wa- looking for somebody... Yeah, just die. and uh, Well, first give your information to the Mormons and then die, and then you'll just wait for a while. But the, the Mormons have this crazy genealogy fetish. Yes. So, well, I wanted... The, the best way I knew how to illustrate how devastating the effects of what Bud Westmore did was to show how difficult it was to uncover her story like how to undo all of that so i was like all right i'll bring everyone along on the ride to show how all the crazy twists and turns finding the breadcrumbs of her life were gonna be um showing all the crazy twists and turns of finding the breadcrumbs of her life and essentially reverse engineering millicent patrick and so one of the the biggest breaks for me in, in the book was a friend of mine told me Go talk to the Mormons. Go to the Mormon temple here in Los Angeles. And the one on uh, in West LA. Yes. Yeah. And what I didn't realize is that, uh, is, I mean, A, there is polygamy in the history of the Mormon church. So they have a lot of interest in genealogy just because gigantic families. But yeah. also there's some. And you don't want to marry your sister. Yes. Inadvertently. It's good to keep track of that. Yeah. Big, a big uh, high up on the in priority list is not marrying your sister. Every, don't be a garbage person. Don't marry your sister. Two mm-hmm. rules of life every day. Right. Uh, but they have this, pra- some Mormons believe in this practice of necrogamy, which is if you were a Mormon man and you die as a bachelor, they can posthumously marry you to another unmarried woman mm, interesting so you in the in the mormon space afterlife have get to have a bride so it's in their interest to have a lot of information about people so they have a uh, like a dating pool essentially how can anyone think that's fake <laughs> Damn, you're trashing my dating my uh, my dating prospects I when I'm dead. You know, <laughs> I'm in a heated relationship with with a Mormon all, space ghost. All the, women, all the women I love are still alive. Like, when Diana Rigg dies, <laughs> oh <until> boy! <laughs> but the cool thing is, apparently, you get to turn them down. So. I so you but you can't get access to these archives unless you give your information and And put yourself into the like the necro dating pool right so I said all right sign me up it's worth it and I gave them my information and you get this it it basically looks like you're going into a middle school computer lab because it's 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 not like a cool archive it's just a room full of old crappy desktop PCs and you get a little login card and you have access to so many databases of genealogical information and that's how I found Millicent's family. Family that are right. still living and, today, and, and you and they were Aunt Mid. Yeah, she had you know she. In addition to the the very difficult 
job you had in researching her, she had like seven names. <laughs> yeah. She literally went she under really seven different names over the course yeah. of her life. And when I finally, I found out that she had siblings and those siblings had children or what those siblings had children and two of them were still alive. I just Googled them in the yellow pages Amazing. and I called up the number like a crazy, like psychopath off of the internet, just called them. I went out outside of the Mormon temple, called them and they were very baffled because no one had ever talked to them before. I'm the only person or I'm the first person to find her family and to talk to them. And her, Melissa and Patrick left everything to that niece that I talked to on the phone and she invited me over and let me go through everything. Mm-hmm. It w- completely broke open my case. So yeah, be a Mormon ghost bride. It really works out for you. Wow. That's amazing. It's such a weird story. Yeah. And I, I still have the login. I'm using it on other projects. It's uh-huh. fantastic. And go- you might meet me and you might meet Mitt Romney. Yeah, he might, you know, who maybe in the afterlife while I'm floating around in Mormon space, he'll come up and ask me to Netflix and chill and I can say, but I can turn him down, which is great. Yeah. Just sit around in our vestments. Yeah, you know, in the special underpants. They, have, and, they do have special underpants. I don't know if they, maybe they make a space version for the afterlife. I like to envision the Mormon space afterlife as the first credit sequence of lost in space yes just, <laughs> arms behind them. yep and they're floating around really enjoying themselves <laughs> dun dun, dun dun, those dun dun, underpants dun dun, are clearly dun dun, comfortable dun dun, dun dun, yeah oh yeah that's amazing uh, that's amazing well before before we wrap up let's um I have, I have two questions for you who are the people um the the uh, are there any of millicent's television appearances available couldn't find see. any of them uh-huh. it, with a book like I this know with Mila, stuff keeps showing up every day they find something else. that's what i'm hoping this is the kind of book that i could basically have continued writing for the rest of my life right there were and there's an afterward where i talk about a couple of things that she might have worked on that i couldn't find proof of so i only put stuff in the book that i could verify and i couldn't find any of her radio or television appearances and i'm hoping that now that the word is out yeah so yeah. i finally had to call it you know i worked on this book for three years yeah. my my agent when it, the day it came out he said we've been working on this for 1200 days and I, so i finally had to be like all right we're done we're calling it right. and so i'm hoping that some with this out in the world someone will say hey i have this old tape or hey i have something you'd be surprised at the stuff that shows up it, yeah it's really alarming um who are the who are some of the who are some of your contemporary heroes who are the people that you get living right now yeah i mean just like you know uh, people in the industry women in the industry that you look up to that you admire that you want to Oh, there's so many amazing female horror directors that are working right yeah. now that are just... Pe- pe- let, me re- let me rephrase that question. Um, who, uh, who are some of the, the, the people today that like Millicent Patrick that are, that are currently working that, you're like, y- that you want to alert, like, that people should know about? Yeah, there's... Like with, with me, it's uh, like my friend Roxanne Benjamin, who... Oh, she direct, kicks a yeah, lot of ass. Yeah, she's, uh, she's so uh, talented. And I'm like, you have... She has a new movie out called Body of uh, Brighton Rock. And I'm like, you have to see this movie. She's so great. And, she, and, and, and she's like... Um, I, I want to tell people about Roxanne because in five years when everybody knows who she is, I want to be able to go, see, I told you. She's see, great. yeah, you got to get in at the ground level. Yeah. Uh, there's a director, Yvonka Vukovic, who oh, is sure. Riot Girls that is coming out this year. That's amazing. Chelsea Peters has a Satanic Panic and All That We Destroy that are coming out. My friend Bria Grant is directing a movie right now and starring in a movie back to back that are going to be coming out, I think, next year. She's a really fantastic horror director. Uh, Anna Lily Ampere, who directed Bad Batch and Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Oh, really? I'm, that's in my queue. Uh, Jennifer Kent, who did the Babadook. I mean, there's oh, yeah, there's so there's a lot of great. There's a lot. There's so many great women that are working in the genre right yeah. now. It's really maybe more than any genre. Yeah, that's what's amazing is that people think that women. There's this weird perception that women can't make horror because it's violent. There's this weird perception that women don't like horror. But if you think about it, women uh, horror is the genre where most you know actresses get their start. Mm-hmm. Where there are more female protagonists that kick ass than any other genre. In addition to uh, the lady from the Black Lagoon, uh, what what's your uh, uh, what's your what's up next for you? I am working on three books because I'm insane. Uh, well, do you want to move? So, do you want to move into writing books? You still in working in production? I'm going to keep doing. So, I uh, split my time between filmmaking, podcasting, and writing, and I'm going to keep doing that. My show that I do every week with my friend Bray Grant, uh, Reading Glasses, uh, is a 
show your where, podcast. Yeah, we it's a show where we talk about reading, but not books. We don't review books on the show. We talk about you know how to get a book back from someone who borrowed it from you. <laughs> how do you how do you get those annoying stickers off the back of a book? Oh, you that's know, interesting. So we talk about the you know. So it doesn't matter if you read comics or eBooks or audio books, whatever you do, whatever kinds of books you like to read, you can listen to Reading Glasses. Oh, um, and, but I, I want to still write nonfiction too. So I have three nonfiction books that I'm working on and I'll, I have tons of movie stuff that I want to do. So I just keep being an insomniac and keep, keep working on stuff. Well, anyway, the, the book is called the lady from the black lagoon as written by Mallory Amira. I really thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having um, me on. This was awesome to, to come out here and, um, uh, well, I, I'm bumping you soon. Pick, pick up the book. It's a, it's a great read. And, uh, Mallory Amira, thanks so much. Thank you. So Charlton Heston came into the makeup lab well, right, in the, right in the beginning, and um, he came in and, and uh, wanted to see what John Chambers was doing, knew him, and they were yakking back and forth, and, and Charlton Heston was watching him sculpt, and he was going through John's makeup, I mean, it's his sculpting tools. John didn't hate anybody touching anything. I can his. imagine. And I could see him out of the corner of his eye looking at him, giving the, you know, don't touch my stuff, but... He's the star of the show. So yeah. he's going through and he said, what's this tool? Blah, 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 blah. And he said, you know, I'm, a, I'm an amateur sculptor, John. Here we he go. Said, yeah. I, I, I do sculpting, you know, like you do. And he's really, okay, Chuck. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. And he then, Charlton Nelson says, you know, he looks at his watch and he says, I got to go to wardrobe fitting, but uh, thanks, John, for showing me everything. And John says, uh, yeah, uh, Chuck, did you see my number seven dental spatula? And he said, what? My number seven, he said, I don't know what that is. He says, it's, it's a little stainless steel spatula. They said, no, I didn't. He said, well, check your pocket. And Charlton Heston pats himself down. Nothing. And he said, no, not that pocket. That pocket, the upper pocket. And he reached it and he goes, oh, my God, I must have stuck it in my pocket. He said, yeah, have a good day, Chuck. <laughs> and, I, and when he left, I said, did I see Moses try to copy your number seven dental spatula? What is this? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, he Charlton Heston was not because uh, I worked with him in the Hawaiians. Following that, mm-hmm. he was not comfortable just being one on one with people. That's or, common, you know. Yeah, yeah, he was not uh, not common. Yeah. And, I mean, not 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 comfortable. And we were working on the pally on the cliffs, and 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 I was making up Geraldine Chaplin, and the wind is blowing like crazy, and he's clumsy. Charlton Heston's mm-hmm. real clumsy. And he tripped and fell. He almost, it was 500 feet to the bottom. And I reached over and grabbed him by the collar and I pulled him back. And he just kind of brushed himself off and kind of, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, that's common. That, 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 that's common uh, for an actor. Yeah. And Geraldine said, does he know you just saved his life? And I said, I don't know if he did or not. Yeah. That's not unusual. His, his son said an interesting thing about him when, uh, about his NRA sort of, uh, yeah, uh, hard my dead hands. And... Yeah, and he goes, you know, you have to remember, he was an actor, and he found an audience. Yeah, and that's where he was comfortable playing to that audience. Same yeah. with Reagan. He yeah. was Reagan played the president. Yeah, you know, and it, just, it worked. Yeah, you know, um, and and you do have to admire him for signing on again. Like he had to be really dumb or really smart because. If that if if the movie didn't work, yeah, it would have been big chance. Yeah, and and you know, big swings pay. Uh, big swings pay off. And what I didn't know uh, that I learned in in the documentary too was that in that summer, nineteen sixty seven, that Planet of the Apes basically shut down a lot of Hollywood because every makeup artist available was working on Planet of the Apes, and you guys were crewed 24 hours a day for three months yeah you talk about when they were making uh singing in the rain and gene kelly was doing his famous dance you couldn't turn on a water faucet within a few blocks of the studio i think it was pretty much the same deal with makeup artists oh, really? they they used everyone well yeah. you know all those makeup artists like uh, that did that work the majority of them were trained just for that job they had no experience Mm-hmm. Most of them were new young people, green people that came in who, uh, who uh, proved to John that they had the talent. And what we did is we did two weeks of them putting a, an appliance on in the morning, take it off at lunch, put it on in the afternoon, take it on in the, uh, off the evening. They did that for two weeks. 
because John wanted to design these makeups like paint by numbers. He didn't want anybody bringing in their own their own uh, artistry or what they think an ape right. should look like. He he needed that continuity, and it worked out really well. So I would set everything up, and one of my jobs was setting up everything on on vacuum forms. He had two, one piece uh, of face and a backup. You had all the colors were lined up. They didn't have anything out of their makeup case. They, right. All they had to use is their scissors and their comb and things like that. Everything else was all set up for Paint them. by numbers, basically. Yeah, because mm-hmm. yeah. there were on, on there were days when you had like two dozen make made up apes on screen. Oh, there were more than that. I think yeah. the the biggest was a day when we had thirty two, thirty two apes that were yeah. made up in in this in in the heat <laughs> in the summer in Los Angeles. Yeah, you know. And, and they're also wearing leather. <laughs> I mean, it was really brutal. Yeah. You know, uh, it's amazing. Now, when, as you're making it, did you have the ability, and I'm assuming, were you ever on the set or were you always running the lab? I, towards the end, I worked on the set. Uh, yeah, uh, because as we got towards the end, we started to catch up on the parts and pieces we needed. So it wasn't as important that I worked a, a long day on in the lab. I would I would go to the set early in the morning at four thirty in the morning. I'd work till about noon, and I'd, I'd I'd have a driver take me back to the lab, and I'd prepare for whatever was coming up the next day. Because I I painted all the parts, all painted everything, pre painted everything before it was turned over to the people. Wow. And did you ever, did you people ever have time to think, uh, I hope this is a good movie? You know, I knew we were working on something. Most people really knew that they were working on something special, and they gave 100%. For some of the older makeup artists have been up and down through so many films. Yeah. They kind of go, eh, let's just see what it turns out to be. They didn't have any investment in it. But the new people... We were all excited. Yeah. 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 It certainly wasn't a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. One story I wanted to ask about John Chambers, uh, and then I want to get into your, your post Planet of the Apes career and your adventures with John Chambers. <laughs> um, there's a recent book that was written about the making of 2001, and they're talking about Stuart Freeborn's uh, work. And, and there, I remember in, in, in that book, they say that Fox sent spies over to his lab, which I'd never heard before and didn't didn't buy at all because mm. 2001 is a masterpiece. The, the ape makeup is nothing. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's it looks more like an ape because that was the job of the script, sure. but it's a primitive design. You can see it's a mechanical device. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's no. Organic. Yeah, I saw them in person, so it was they weren't foam latex. They were. Um, they were a slip rubber, like a regular mask. And yeah. so when they moved, they buckled and Yeah, crinkled. exactly. There's no... But uh, they filmed them brilliantly, so you never really saw that. But if you yeah. saw them in person, you'd think th- they were pretty crude. Yeah, it was pretty crude. And, and yeah. I remember that somebody said to John, like, maybe you'd like to go over and see what Stuart Freeborn's doing. And he went, what do I, what's some British guy going to teach me? <laughs> yeah. It's really staunch Irish attitude towards it. Yeah, he didn't like the British. Well, real, real Irish. Being Irish. Yeah, real Irish yeah. guys don't. So after Apes comes out, it's a huge success. You all get, well, John gets an Academy Award. And then uh, Chambers, uh, you and John Chambers and another guy go into business. My brother. You're, oh, it's your brother. It's your yeah. brother. Okay. And what is your first post Planet of the Apes? Well, we had it. I, I, John Chambers, um, I got hired by a makeup artist named Bob Don, son of Jack Don and, and father of Jeff Don, who's still working, and to do a thing called uh, Ardry Papers. And it was all about the uh, you know, was Wolper was doing the film. David Wolper? David Wolper, and he was making this film where he, it's about the story of, of man, of you know discovering fire and discovering all the different, the different levels of where all the way from Australopithecus man to Neanderthals right. and Cro-Magnon. And so that was what it was all about. And it was such a, a, a screwed up production, they could not release it. They could not release it and after all these extensive makeups and hair suits and that sort of thing. And so they decided to do a, turn it into a TV series. 
and they did a, a three three part show called Primal Man. Yeah, I saw that. I saw yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And so and when I saw it when we it looked like Planet of the Apes. Yeah. <laughs> so when we started that studio, that that was our first job. Our first job. John Chambers had nothing to do with that part. Mm-hmm. He had to do something with the, with, with designing, help designing the Ardry papers. But now it's just my show. So when John wanted to start, I could bring my show into our new studio, and that kept us going. One day, he comes in and he looks kind of down. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story uh, I, before that. What happened was he came in. We were working work with all the CIA folks right and he always checked the books and it was my job to keep the books so i kept the books and he comes in and he calls me and says, tommy come in the office i come in there and he says we're short 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 what petty cash you taking care of the petty cash tommy <laughs> yeah i do petty cash we're short huh your brother know anything about this i said no i, I do at least get your brother in here so i call my brother sonny and he comes in and my brother had been in Marine DI and been in the Marine yeah. 15 years and wounded twice in Vietnam. Yeah. He wouldn't want to mess around with him. Yeah. And so John calls me and he point. says, uh, so well, his real name is Ellis. And he says, so Ellis, tell me something. Uh, petty cash. You know anything about petty cash? He says, no, Tom takes care of it. And he says, well, we're short. And my brother says, how short? And John says, 64 cents. And my brother with a perfect straight face, isn't that why they call it petty cash? <laughs> that was too much for Chambers. He went ballistic and threw all his stuff down and stormed out. The following week, he came back in. He was haggard looking. He was beat up looking. And he told me he had Hodgkin's disease and that he had we had to buy him out. But the real fact is he couldn't stand somebody... <laughs> Coming back with that line, he was serious about that yeah. sixty-four cents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He couldn't. He couldn't have yeah. his authority. No, that challenge. was too much. Sixty-four cents. He couldn't have his authority challenged. And that's when we uh, bought him out. Yeah, and then you found out later that he didn't have it. That's I find this fascinating, and we'll confirm this. He comes and goes, guys. I've just been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. You have to buy me out. Yeah. You guys don't have the money to buy him out. You've got to scrape and scrounge and take out a second. Every cent we have. That you do. Every cent we have. How long after that did you find out, I don't really have Hodgkin's lymphoma. I just wanted you to buy me out. That's insane. Well, he went right back into business. It's yeah. insane. Not only You're that, right. but then the projects that Tom worked on, they had to give credit to Chambers because he had an Oscar, and the studio wanted the Oscar winner sure. to have the credit yeah. on Phantom it. Phantom of the Paradise, we didn't get, I didn't get credit on it because, and he had nothing to do with it, but... They wanted to use his Academy right. Award as, and that you know that that's a movie that has grown in cult stature yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, 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 that that movie's uh, has uh, has had a long shelf life. He was a mentor to you, and then you don't speak for a long time. Yeah, well, there's another part that was uh, uh, that was even worse than that. Uh, there was a plane crash. And the whole, my, I lost my whole crew, which we were all apprentices together when we were make, uh, doing Planet of the Apes. I'd known these guys forever. The guy that suggested that I get called Fox for my apprenticeship, he was on the plane. So yeah. five people died that, from makeup, and the whole 33 people in the crew died. Was it a, pro- a production flight? Or? It was a production flight. They were shooting the last, the last shoot up in Mammoth. The last shoot of Primal Man okay. when the plane crashed coming home. So it was devastating for me. Absolutely devastating. These guys were all, we were such close, close friends. And uh, so I put everybody's name in for an Emmy. And John put, John first put me and him in for an Emmy. And so when I found out he did that, I said, I'm going to put everybody in. Yeah. So I put everybody's name in. And John took their names off. And when he took their names off that Emmy, that was, to me, was like unforgivable mm-hmm. because. They'd never get an Emmy again. They were, right. you know, they were the ones that did the work, and they all got killed in the thing. So um, I didn't talk to him a long time until I until he called me up and wanted me to work on work with him on Island to Doctor Moreau. Right, and I said I would not work for him ever again. But we shared credit. We and that that was brought me back into the. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you did have a reproach bond at the end of his life. Yeah, well, and and Island to Doctor Moreau, he became completely over the top. He just he was just such a jerk. Yeah, and Dan Stripek, who had worked with him all those years, those people never spoke to him again. I finally went back when I found out he was in the hospital. He wouldn't answer any phone calls or anything, so I went back when he was in the hospital, and and um, 
at his birthday and then visited him after that just before he died. Did he have kids? No. Yeah. Well, that explains some of that. Yeah. Yeah. You're, uh, it's kind of like a father and son. It is. And I have that. Um, I have that. I have a, I have a John Chambers in my life. Yeah. But we don't have a, we have a good relationship still. Yeah. But, uh, an older, uh, writer uh comedian that yeah. very very much a mentor to me yeah um, who also didn't have kids and and when you uh, somebody said you're either and this applies to women and then the other roles you're a father or you're a son and uh you're a father you are aware of other people's needs you take care of other people you look out for other people because that's your job if you're a son it doesn't matter how old you are you are waiting to be taken care of you are yeah. waiting to you know and uh and that's it's, the world needs all sorts of bits and pieces to go but the, but that's what it sounds like it's like yeah you 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 need you needed some oh, the close encounters of the third kind could have only been made by a guy that didn't have kids. Cause at the end, Richard Dreyfus looks at his kids says goodbye and walks on a spaceship and takes off. It's like yeah. no father would do that. Nobody yeah. with kids would ever say this is bullshit. And Richard. just for the record, Tom did the aliens for close encounters. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> but so now, you know, yeah, yeah, you, um, exactly. It's like, no, you're so that, that does make sense. Was he, was he married? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. His wife was very shy. She was from Kentucky, back country of Kentucky. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And uh, you went on after, uh, and then you went on to have the was it the Berman? Yeah, we made the Berman Studio after Berman Studio, right? Yeah. And you directed a movie. You directed. Uh, I did. I directed a little movie called Life on the Edge. Uh huh. And I wanted to do something quirky. It was quirky. Made money, but yeah. I, I realized I'm not a director. I directed a short and realized I wasn't a director. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like this. <laughs> My feet hurt. <laughs> no, and you know, and you know, it's, it's not about talent or anything else. It's about how you can stretch that talent out over the whole show and maintain mm-hmm. that and, and maintain everything that's happening because you're in charge. Yeah, I, I don't. Ex- I I'm I like I like to, I, I I like to write, and then people are so relieved when I go. Yeah, I don't want to direct. I just want, I'll write it. I like yeah. to write it. And well, what I found fascinating about the documentary. Uh, making apes is you know i've been obsessed with planet of the apes since i can remember um i grew up just eyeball deep in it um and there's stuff in this and this documentary is a whole other story of of stuff i had no idea and 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 how did this come about why well i'd been i've been looking for a while for a project uh i I'm a documentary filmmaker. I love documentaries. I wanted to make a documentary about Hollywood because I, I believe in many cases what happened behind the scenes is just as interesting as what wound up on the screen. Mm-hmm. And I got to know Tom and Barry through uh, a year-round uh, cinema program here in Santa Barbara. I'm the official photographer for that, and they always sit up in the front of the theater. I'm always up in the front of the right. theater. And uh, we got to know each other over a period of a couple of years, and Tom would tell these amazing stories before every screening. I think I'd get to the screenings extra early to hear Tom tell these stories about working on all these iconic films. And um, uh, eventually, Tom said, are you interested in doing this? And I think I cut him off mid-sentence with yes. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and then we kind of got into the research phase, because I knew Roddy had made that fantastic documentary back yeah. in like 1999. So I pulled out my box set of Planet of the Apes, yeah. this Every legitimate film fan has a copy of it. Um, So I put that on and I watched it and I went, wow, this is a two hour documentary and there's about, I don't know, 120 seconds worth of makeup talk in it. So I'm thinking it's a story that really hasn't been told. So we started doing our research. I think we researched for a good year um, and because it it revolutionized makeup the way Star Wars revolutionized special effects. Yeah, well, Dan Strepek says it in the documentary. He thinks that the makeup in Planet of the Apes is equivalent to sound in The Jazz Singer. Yeah, I agree. Which, I, agree. I yeah. mean, it's, it's a turning point. Yeah. There are very few turning points for each part of Hollywood, and that's one of them. Because yeah. um, they're... The thing that we never covered is that in this conversation, the actors give legitimate performances. Yeah. You know... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can feel all the emotion oh, yeah. in Roddy's face yeah. and Kim Hunter, and, yeah. and and also having you know such prominent actors, having Oscar winners wear the makeup. Yeah. Um, so our initial approach to this was we were going to just interview the 
original makeup artists, Tom, Dan Streepeck, Fred Blau, all the ones that, uh, uh, Frank Griffin, all the people who had worked in the original one. And the focus was going to be, you were there at this turning point in Hollywood. Uh, what was your career like before? What was your memories of working on it? And then what happened afterwards? You went on and did Star Trek. You went on and did Star Wars. You went on and did this uh, and that. And, and every single one of them, you know, you go on IMDb and it's, there's no six degrees of Kevin Bacon. There's six degrees to Planet of the Apes. Right, right. Every That's makeup nice. artist who worked on there has a defining role in all the great films that involve makeup for the 50 years afterwards. So I think we got maybe five or six interviews in the can of all the original artists. And then we started hearing, well, you know, today's makeup artists want to have their say in why it was so influential on them. Yeah. So we start bringing in Greg Canham and Howard Berger and Greg Nicotero and Rick Baker. And we're talking to all these people. And then you got film historians and they're willing to give their thoughts on it. So we've got Leonard Malton and Scott Esman and everyone jumping jump in on that. Then we get directors, Richard Donner and yeah. Joe Dante and John Landis and and then, of course, John is great because John was actually there as a male yes, boy was, yeah. when he was 17 years old. Yeah. Uh, and then and we, it was amazing that you got you managed to get John to come out of his shell. <laughs> yeah, he's he's just <laughs> such an introvert, <laughs> such an introvert. That was uh, I, I could. We, our, our first edit, our our first edit of this film was over four hours long because so many of the John Landis stories were like five, so six weird. minute long stories, and I didn't want to cut a single word I, of them. I love so. him so much. Yeah, and, and then. And Dana, you you came and oh, gave yeah. your opinions, and it was great to have. We really had the gamut of Planet of the Apes, you know, production, fandom, everything in there. And I think at the end of it, we had about 120 hours worth of interview yeah, footage. Yeah. It's, a, it's it's it, but it, the the what I was amazed at in the documentary is that you it, it it's it's about Planet of the Apes, but it, it's really about a group of people that take on. A, a seemingly impossible task and necessity is the mother of invention and, and they, they get it done. And it's also the story of any group dynamic of, of any music, of any band, of any presidential cabinet, mm -hmm. of any major corporation that people with egos and abilities come together and they accomplish something greater, but it, there's a li there's there's a lifespan to it, where the 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 lubrication of necessity wears away, and the gears begin to grind. Mm -hmm. And that was fascinating to me. Just to, you can you know how and how that tension makes things makes things happen. And uh, What's well, interesting, Dan Streepeck said there was this column of creativity that doesn't happen very often. It happened in this documentary. The people we brought in, the, the editor, the, the you know, the wonderful music that uh, it was um, fantastic. It's brilliant, yeah. brilliant. And he had nine days to get this done. Yeah, my my, Sean, my Sean nephew, Patterson, just yeah. fantastic. My nephew, so my nephew, uh, my brother's son, uh, Skipper Ellis Third, he did all the sound mixing on it, and the sound is, I, I think it's just so clear because I, I, I have bad ears, so when I listen to movies today. I miss so much of it because they always have ambient sound mm -hmm. in it and they have music and it, it, you're in conflict of yeah. vo other voices and whatnot. But I think Skip did the perfect job of that. And to have a full circle moment, Skip, I mean, it's amazing. Tom worked on the original Planet of the Apes and Skip is this amazing sound mixer. Skip was actually the one who did the uh, remixes for the Blu-rays of the Planet of the Apes films. Oh, okay. So then yeah. he came in on this documentary already having that under his belt too, right. which was amazing. So the, the, yeah. the doc has played at uh, Santa Barbara Film Festival, it's screened at USC. Are, uh, are, you're st are you, do you have a distributor? Are you uh, we're working talking on, to distributors now? We're working on that right now. Uh, we've got a lot of film festivals coming up later in the year that we've yeah. submitted to. What so. festivals are you uh, hoping to nail? Um, Clearly DocuSlam. We're, we've got a lot of doc festivals. Uh, I'd love to see us get up to Seattle. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, we've submitted to uh, New Orleans, Chicago. Um, we, tried, we tried to have geographical awareness because we did a crowdfunding campaign for the doc. Mm -hmm. And we literally had supporters in every nook and cranny of this country. Yeah. And they all kept saying, well, when are we going to see it? you got to bring it to Chicago. you got to bring mm -hmm. it to Boston. you got to bring it to Florida. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to really keep it all around the country. Yeah, it, it is. An, it, it, what I, you know, what I love, I, I equated it to, the documentary about the making of Apocalypse Now. Mm -hmm. 
it's a brilliant companion piece to the to the film, and it tells as interesting a story as the film. It, it never like you know I thought I knew everything that you know I was like I know this, and I was I never looked at my watch. It's such a great piece of work, and, and um, we'll keep people posted on the on the on the podcast as to where they can see it or how they can uh, contact you. Uh, but uh, I, I, I can't thank you guys enough for uh, giving me uh, your time today. Uh, thank you so much. Other podcasts reach for the sky. Can it go down? We barely try. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to say, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want me, peace out, boom.